Uh, you see a pepper? Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I Okay, we are live, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll uh, go ahead and get started here. We do have a few folks in here. I can actually believe Representative Ottman's here. So welcome. And uh, uh, former Senate President Eli Bebout uh, came down. So glad uh, glad you can host us here in Riverton. It's good to see you. <laughs> That's what I plan to do. We'll see see what happens. So, um, well, committee, let's get back to it. Uh, we're picking up on the tail end of our morning agenda here, talking about um, recreation on state lands. So, uh, Director Scoggins, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in your materials, I provided kind of a short PowerPoint to sort of set the table here, um, meaning uh, to remind the committee sort of the, the legal landscape, if you will, around recreating on state lands. And so I'll just kind of go through that high level. And then I, I know that this is kind of a follow-up to the camping discussion that we had in June. And I did have a meeting with um, Director Nesbick and Director Westby on those issues. And so um, hopefully we've got some game and fish and state parks folks here that uh, can also address the committee. So main principle here with, res with respect to state lands, as everybody knows, um, state lands are a trust asset. Um, the state accepted the grant of those lands made by the US to Wyoming for educational purposes and the um, various institutions and beneficiaries. The Board of Land Commissioners in the Constitution has direction, control, disposition, and care of the lands. And by statute, um, OSLI has a fiduciary duty um, related to preserving that trust asset. Um, the board has rules, Chapter 13, which um, extend the privilege to recreate on state lands. Um, those are legally accessible lands unless they've been closed by the board. Um, the um, recreating can't damage the lands or existing roads. There's no hunting or fishing on cultivated cropland and no organized recreational uses are allowed without a special use lease authorization. Now chapter 13 does not provide a fee or a license structure to utilize state lands. Um, both the um, 
rules and statute 362107 specifically prohibit off-road motor vehicle use, third party generating or seeking fees for recreating on state lands, open fires and overnight camping. And violations of those prohibitions are a misdemeanor. Um, and it, I think the statute notes that peace officers and game and fish have authority to enforce um, those um, prohibitions. We also allow um, some recreational leasing through Wyoming statute 36.5, 114 and 115. Um, so OSLI can issue leases for recreational purposes, but they can't impair existing leases. Um, fair market value is the charge, and usually those SULs are for things like cabin sites, um, public parks and recreation areas, golf courses, um, ski or winter sports areas, and youth activities. We also utilize our temporary use permit system for um, organized recreational activities, and these are sort of short, short term the TUP has a 30-day limit uh, for $25 a day. You can hold your wedding or a race or some other gathering, organized recreational activity on state lands. We also allow outfitting, both exclusive and non-exclusive, um, under the TUP process and other appropriate activities of limited duration. Uh, there are some, there is the ability of the board to restrict certain parcels for recreating, and I did put in there in your materials, there's a board matter that sort of sets forth the process. It is a public process where there's public input, um, notice and other communications that, that go on. Um, restrictions uh, include restrictions for game and fish walk-in areas or hunter management areas, um, road and vehicle closures. If we see that people are out there mud bogging and doing other things to destroy the land, um, sometimes the board will restrict that activity. Um, there are parcels around the state, too, where we have um, shooting firearms problems, where they've shot things up and um, degraded the, the state asset. And um, so the board tries to stay on top of those things, but it's pretty unusual for the board to close um, activities on state lands. It's got to be something pretty egregious. They try not to do that, if at all possible. Um, as I mentioned, we do work with Game and Fish. Um, for walk-in areas and hunter management areas. Uh, we also rely on Game and Fish to review our restriction proposals when we have those related to, you know, vehicles or shooting firearms, that sort of thing. Um, we also have an MOU in place with Game and Fish, and I included that in your materials so that you could see that um, that MOU has an enforcement component, although there are some limits related to their federal funding that I'm sure they can um, talk about. Also under the MOU, um, they help educate us on some of the restrictions and impacts to wildlife. And they're also to provide state lands with an annual report. So we see how many tickets they've written and what enforcement and other aspects um, look like. And I included the report with the materials. As far as partnering with state parks, um, currently state parks does not have the authority to enter into lease agreements with the board for recreational uses. And OSLI, we don't want to manage recreational activities. We don't have the staff or the, the know-how. We also don't have the enforcement ability, but we wouldn't mind partnering with um, state parks to do that. And House Bill 54, during the last legislative session, that was kind of a what that bill was all about. Um, it would have allowed lease agreements between state parks um, and the board. It, would allow site-specific rule enforcement to state parks and would allow them to charge for uses of the state lands and utilize that compensation to pay for the state lease and to fund management activities. And I think the idea for that um, bill was largely um, to help with the bus situation, which is um, mountain bike trails and that sort of thing. And um, we were hoping that state parks could help us manage that in consultation and conjunction with the existing lessee um, so that we weren't seeing the trails um, erode <laughs> the um, state trust lands and also, as I mentioned, um, any sort of rule enforcement and charging for that activity, we simply don't have um, the ability to do. So um, with that, Mr. Chairman, in my discussions with Director Nesvik and um, Director Westby. Um, Director Nesvik did mention that there may have been a pilot project many years ago related to 
um, in potential camping or campfires or something on state land. Um, I don't know the details of that, but certainly the issues with um, camping and campfires on state land, lands, I think we all agreed um, the issues include funding and personnel and just the ability to manage the resource, but certainly can um, see some of the benefits and the desire for that. And so I would, um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for questions, but more importantly, I think uh, we, there are some state parks people here, and I'm not sure if Gaiman, I thought Gaiman Fish was going to attend, but I'm not sure if they're here or not, and maybe somebody has information on that pilot project. Very good. Thank you, Director. Any questions? Okay, thank you for the information. Have anybody from Game and Fish or State Parks come on down? Oh. Okay, it sounds good. We'll we'll do uh, Game and Fish online. Then uh, if you feel free, come on down to the front, and then we'll see you nice and ready. So. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman, Mr. Co-Chair, members of the committee. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rick King. I'm Chief Game Warden with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And, and really, I, I, I won't take up too much of your time. I'll just touch briefly on uh, a number of years ago, the department did engage in some conversations with OSLI about camping on state land. So currently camping is prohibited but our game wardens run into a lot of camping violations as they're out uh, patrolling for other uh, wildlife violations and doing their work. So about a decade ago, we, we did have a discussion about starting a pilot program to where potentially some camping could be permitted on some of the, the more popular parcels where we see a lot of camping. That, that project really never got off the ground. I, I think, um, both both agencies identified that it would be worthwhile to pursue on a small scale, just uh, kind of dip dip our toes in the water, so to speak. Um, but but it just fell flat and and never never really took off, and and we didn't implement that pilot project. So we we still have the past information on which parcels we had identified uh, may be worth including in a pilot project, and and we're certainly willing to, to re-engage in that effort if it's, if it's so desired. And with that, I'll, I'll stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any questions for Gavin Fish? Representative Larson. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I guess maybe, uh, can you give us a number how many violations you do, uh, maybe uh, on average annually uh, on state lands? Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson. So in this past year, we documented a, approximately a, about 100 violations. Uh, they were roughly split between about uh, 40 off-road violations, about 40 camping violations, about 13 open fire violations, and a handful of littering violations. And that's that's about um, average. We've had, you know, in the last five or six years, we've had upwards of 150 violations, somewhere between 100 and 150 violations each year over the last six or seven years. Okay, and just to verify that, it's only on state lands. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. And that, that report we submit annually, and I'd be happy to share that report again with you so you can see the breakdown of citations versus warnings and, and, and some pictures of some of the violations we encounter. Yeah, I think that'd be useful information for the committee, absolutely. Okay, okay, good deal. Okay, any further discussion committee? Any further questions for Game of Fish? Okay, well, thanks for your uh, information, appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. Next up, we have state parks. Welcome, sir. Mr. Chairman, Dave Glenn, Deputy Director of Wyoming State Parks, Historic Sites and Trails. Uh, you know, in nine, from 2019 to 2020, visitation in our parks went up from 4.3 million to 5.8 million, 35% increase in visitation. And working with our federal partners and discussing with them and other agencies, we saw this statewide. 
Uh, we've dropped down a little bit. We're probably estimating about 5.3 million this year, but that that the, the the number of people coming to Wyoming to recreate is just going to continue to increase and increase. And one of the things we do is really work to educate those folks, disperse those folks at, when needed at times, and also concentrate those folks when needed at times. Uh, our job is to manage recreation. That's what we do. And we have the pros out there that are, that are working to do those things. I'm going to be very, very quick, but I think any of us that tried to find a camping spot in the Bighorns the last three or four years understands that it's almost impossible to go up on a Friday afternoon and find a dispersed camping site to, to just camp for the weekend. Uh, and I think that's where you're starting to see some of these overflows going over to, onto state lands. So the, the, the bill that the director was mentioning, uh, that is up to you all to decide on, on how, how to approach that. But one of the things we can do to help on those types of things is using that bus area outside of Lander as an example. I know that the lessee was having trouble with user created trails, uh, the parking along the road, other things. If something were to enroll, if that was a, the, the, the folks, uh, your all's desire, we would, could come in, then uh, potentially apply for federal funding to build a parking lot, to put a pit toilet in. Uh, it's very close to Sinks Canyon, which would allow us to uh, have our law enforcement people there as well. Uh, obviously, we're going to need to, to charge to be able to do something like that. And uh, you know, some sort of user fee, such as uh, a, a day use fee, like at our parks. Uh, I'm just gonna leave it at that and, and stand for any questions, if you have any questions. Any questions, committee? Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. All right. So next we have public comment. Any public comment on recreational issues on state lands? Okay, going once, going twice. Public comment is closed. Right, committee, any discussion on this item? Uh, Senator Cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think if at all possible, we ought to see if there's um, possibly we can create a motion or something to try to get something moving between the parks and the land. It would bring more money in. And I also, I think we uh, can open up some areas that a lot of people would be interested in going into. So, yeah, I think if we could maybe look at something there, it might be worthwhile. Um, did you have a specific suggestion, Senator? Or no? Not at this very minute, but I will. Okay. okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. So we have a bill before us that has been sponsored by State Parks Recreation Management Authority. <clears throat> Are they going to sponsor this? Or are they wanting us to join in with it? Or, or um, I guess I'm curious how this is going to work. Will it come through the Ag Committee? Or is that a possibility? Or, or is it going to be theirs? All right, so as part of your committee materials, uh, it's House Bill, I think, 45 from last yeah. year. 50, and 54, 54, excuse me. and. Uh, um, so that's one possibility. I, I'll admit I'm not familiar with this uh, particular uh, bill or, or uh, how it fared before. I, I seem to remember some uh, controversy <laughs> regarding, um, you know, potential recreational uses around uh, Sinks Canyon in particular. And I don't know if this is uh, a part of that. And I, I seem to remember some uh, some tension there in the Senate between a few, a few of our members uh, over this concept. So. Uh, we do have a bill draft from us. I'm not sure if it's necessarily in our wheelhouse as the Ag Committee to take up this issue, but we are talking about state lands. So, um, okay, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I was just looking up in the digest. It looks like this bill draft of House Bill 54 during the last session, um, it looks like it. Uh, it made it through the House, and then in the Senate failed on the third reading, 14 to 15, with one person um, absent or I have not yet found actually what that last person or the uh, one person was excused. So that's the what happened with this bill draft. Okay. 
Oh, there you go. Okay. Representative Sweeney, are you still there? This is your co-sponsor on this bill. has his hand up. Go ahead, Representative Sweeney. Feel free to turn on your video and then give us a background on this uh, piece of legislation. Well, I'm not prepared. So we just, um, we did have uh, TRW the last couple of days and uh, I, I we didn't review this. So, um, and I, my memory fails me. So not quite sure. Um, what to say on that. So, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay, all right, well, it's there for our consideration. Um, but, okay, so before we have any further discussion, can we move on to the next topic? I just ask one more time if we have a motion for a bill draft and, you know, it can be as specific or as broad as, you know, the bringer of the amendment wants. Um, but otherwise, we're going to be moving on the agenda. Senator Cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would move that we um, put to be, together a bill between the uh, recreation, the, the uh, parks and recreation, and the uh, state land to come up with a plan for use of some of the areas in the state. And I'm not going to be specific on that. But uh, with some kind of a fee for people to be able to uh, get a permit to camp uh, and utilize that land a little bit more, and then the people know where they can go. I have had a lot of people complaining about we don't know what lands we can get on and what we can't right now. And so uh, maybe this would start opening that door to where there's an opportunity for people to be able to use those lands and bring more funds into the state. Mr. Chairman, I would I'd second that. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, so I guess with the condition that we do a little research on it and try to figure out what was wrong with the bill and how we can amend it to, to be more suitable suitable for both houses, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just quickly read some of this. House Bill 54, and I'm thinking that it's may cover what Senator Cost wants to do when it talks about authority to lease exchange lands, uh, power to lease and rent concessions, permits to use state lands, recreation areas, and historic sites. Um, I might take a look at that bill instead of starting from scratch. Okay, thank you, Representative. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, there's a motion on the table. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. Okay, that motion carries. Okay, any further discussion on this recreation topic? Okay, so we'll be moving on to our 130. Oh, you got something, Representative Blackman? Okay, all right. Okay, so we'll move on to our other bill drafts we have prepared for this meeting. Um, so starting with LSO 134, uh, and have staff come down and just give an overview of the bill, what it's, uh, what it would be doing, and uh, we'll go from there. Good afternoon, Chairman Boner. Uh, in committee, uh, Luke Plum, LSO, here to discuss, yes, 23 LSO 134. This bill is a state land leasing automatic application resubmittal. And so in under the terms of this bill, OSLI will consider a prior application resubmitted for an existing lease under the same terms of a prior application for that lease state land. Um, the rental offer offered in the application must still meet fair market value as it is required throughout statute. And so under the terms of this bill, OSLI will provide 120 days notice if a rental in a prior application has fallen below the fair market value. And the applicant who is the current lessee of the state lands 
must provide a higher offer within 30 days to at least meet um, fair market value. Failure to do so will result in, result in the application not being resubmitted. Um, I should note that the conflicting application process remains the same uh, as is in currently in statute, but the notice to the current lessee is slightly changed based on the auto resubmittal of their application. So if there is not a conflicting application um, received by OSLI, then the uh, OSLI will give 30 days notice to the current lessee um, before the expiration of their lease to say that their application was resubmitted, that uh, they are then would re be required to pay pursuant to Wyoming Statute 36.5103. That's the filing fee, the first year's rental, and to pay for the use of any improvements. And uh, the resubmitted application will be canceled if the leasee withdraws their application, no longer qualifies to lease state lands, refuses or neglects to complete the lease, or you know fails to follow the rules of the board or anything else of that nature. I believe that covers the changes to this bill and um, or to this section of statute. And I would stand for any questions. Okay, any questions, committee? Okay, appreciate it. And once again, committee, as a reminder, it's just this is part of our efforts to make sure that less land goes vacant. Um, and the thought here is that. Uh, we don't want something going vacant if everybody if the lessee is up to date on their payments and otherwise in good standing we don't want them to at least to go vacant just because they didn't uh, file the paperwork on time so uh i should introduce that probably to begin with and that's one way we can do it um so that being said uh director scoggin welcome back love to hear how you see this um bill impacting your operations Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have a couple of concerns with managing it this way. Um, in the case of lease assignments, um, we're not sure we would have a previous application from that existing lessee. So we'd have to change up our process to make sure that um, when somebody um, decides to do an assignment that they're also doing an application at that point in time. Um, we may not know about any changes that the lessee may have had during the term of the lease. If we do it this way, and we may not know if the lessee still even meets the minimum requirements under 365101. Um, annual rent changes each year based on the board's equation. The notice can simply, we think, be an invoice um, with the renewal language added. Uh, but if the lessee doesn't submit payment, can they still submit an application or do they not renew the lease? Um, the 30 day notice seems a little contradictory or it may not be needed if the initial notice is sent on this. Um, it, it's a little bit complicated to us as far as how to keep track of, you know, what when we're sending what and to whom. Um, there would be no way for us to know if a lessee is still qualified to lease it, but we, if we haven't received an application stating that. Um, and if the um, lessee isn't eligible per the draft bill, is the application is it the application that's canceled? Um, if uh, what application is canceled, if none is submitted, or does the lease simply expire? The other thing that we're um, concerned about is there is some case law that talks about automatic renewals. Um, and I, I think as long as the board maintains its discretion to not automatically renew, I think you're fine. But I think that the Supreme Court had said previously in the early 1900s that um, just continuing to renew um, in the event it takes away the board's discretion could be contradictory to the Constitution um, because the Constitution says 10-year um, ter lease terms. So those would be our concerns. It's not that we can't manage it. We just have to change our process and procedures a little bit. Okay, so the whole point of this exercise is to sort of find ways to reduce the workload in ways that you know make sense for everybody involved. Would this be more work than it saves? Then? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be more work um, with the noticing and trying to keep track of the assignments and all of the and then getting applications um, from the assinees when they're getting the assignments. Um, it's it's going to complicate things. I think it might be easier to manage like a. Um, a cure period, if you will, as opposed to an automatic renewal period, at least based on the staffing we have currently. And could you maybe explain what a cure period is uh, for the committee? A cure period would be 
in the event that we don't receive your materials um, prior to the deadline, that we could then notify the applicant and say, hey, we don't have your materials or we don't have your money or whatever it is, and you have until this date um, to get that to us. Otherwise, we consider that it will go okay. vacant. We think that might be easier to manage, um, particularly, and uh, Deputy Director Crowder and I, we talked about how it, this might be an easy way to do it would be just to shift everything over 30 days so that um, the, the funds and the um, renewal application are due 30 days sooner than what they are now, and then use that 30 days before the expiration of the lease to cure anything in between there, and then you can still get it to the board or if there's a problem with an assignment, whatever it is, um, we have 30 days to figure that out before um, there's a problem with that. Okay, so the overall objective that you don't have a lot go bank just because of the technical error or somebody forgot a portion of the application or something like that. Correct. And I think in this day and age, like even credit card payments, right? They say it's due this day, but you have like 10 days to do it or whatever. So sort of along those lines, I think that would be easier for us to manage. Okay. Thank you. Thank Any you. Questions, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Any public comment? Mr. McGagan, come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a couple of uh, comments with regard to this. We, we do believe that this concept has merit and would like to see it move forward. I would point out that as we read this uh, proposed legislation, it's not an automatic renewal. It's an automatic uh, submission of a renewal application. The renewal still requires approval of the board land commissioner. So we don't see that as being in, in violation of any court decision or anything like that. Uh, the part that's a little bit confusing is that if the annual rental offered is below fair market of the previous one is below fair market value, directors shall provide notice that it's going to go up uh, if it's above the current value because values go both up and down. It seems a little bit confusing, and I would just suggest for your thought that maybe when the uh, when the board sends a notice out that your, your lease has been submitted for consideration for automatic renewal, they would simply provide in that it will be renewed at the rate of X amount, which is the amount determined for the first year of the lease. Because as I understand visiting with office of state lands, by the time their notices go out, they know what the rate's gonna be for the next year. And that would become the rate for the next 10 years or not for the next 10 years, but the rate at which renewal takes place. So I think rather than the confusion here about if it's gonna go up or if it's below, as long as the parties know that whatever the rate is determined to be using the formulas in statute for the first year of the renewed lease, that's the rate that's going to be in their lease that we could avoid some of the confusion it's involved the way this is worded right now. But other than that, we think this is a very good approach. Uh, the other approach that's been suggested of just a grace period at the end is also workable uh, from our perspective. But I think it would require, it would be more of a burden on the state land office than this approach would uh, because this one is just one notice and automatically goes through unless you say, I don't want my lease or unless there's a conflicting bid. Okay, any questions for the stock growers? Thank you. Okay, thank Chairman. you, sir. Any further public comment? Any comment online? Okay, go once, go on twice. Public comment is closed. All right, committee, um, any discussion on this bill draft? Uh, we had a couple of suggestions, and I'm not sure if we're quite ready to uh, sponsor a bill at this point, but. Um, Seems like we have a couple of options before us. So go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, so about a week ago, the uh, Chairman Boner and I were in on a conversation, and you heard the the word cure, and we kind of perked up because it sounded like a pretty good idea. And that approach comes from regulations within the federal government uh, concerning the the uh, administration. Um, the Administ Federal Administrative Procedures Act. 
and it allows for this period of time grace where something goes out of compliance either a delinquent payment or or whatever goes out of compliance and this they'll get a brief period of time to bring themselves back into compliance before actions taken and it uh the advantage to that i i think it would be less work for state lands because it would get cleared up right away with a lot of legal hassling the real advantage to to any of the um the leases that that get stuck in this dilemma is going to be expense a, a quick appeal to bring yourself into compliance um possibly just by making a payment that needs to be made or clearing up some some problems that are there seems like a, a reasonable way to do things um and i i guess i would like to suggest maybe we draft a bill and work on both of these at the same time try to figure out what, what would work best uh we for whatever reason we don't so the federal administrative uh procedure act encompasses licenses and all all kinds of things but it's used for federal grazing um grazing and leasing that goes on federal lands <clears throat> i would suggest that we explore doing about the same thing with the state of wyoming um offer a period of grace allow people to come under compliance it could help a lot with vacant lands i don't know how what the period of grace is going to be, how long that'll have to be determined. But I'd like to explore that as a possibility. And and um, we we just got a taste of it is really all all we got. Um, but it seems like a good way to do things in Wyoming. To rather than I I got you you're thrown out you're kicked off the land we go ahead and give them a chance to comply come under compliance and and fix things before they get real complicated. Um, and I would suggest, if the committee's open to it, that we draft a, a second bill and try to work on both of them, possibly incorporate the two. But that cure process could work as a statute statutory change with the with state lands. So um, that that would be a suggestion I have. Was that a motion, Mr. Chairman, to get a bill draft I, going to? Further? I would move that. Okay. Let's move. Do we have a second? second? Okay, second by Senator Wasserberg. So the motion is to get a bill draft going for our next meeting uh, to allow for a grace period or a cure period. And that'll help uh, 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 the circumstance or avoid the circumstance where we have lands going vacant because of a minor paperwork issue. Or, um, uh, so that's the idea. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Okay, can we, we also have this current bill draft in front of us? Uh, I think we heard some testimony that needs some work. Uh, there's even, even a, I think, a disagreement <laughs> among, uh, you know, uh, folks with experience in state lands as to how, how it would uh, play out. So I think it needs a little bit more consideration and some amendments uh, uh, from uh, everybody that's going to be affected by it. So, um, entertain a motion to uh, uh, go ahead and uh, push this bill draft to the next meeting and amend it uh, as needed. Uh, it seems like mostly um, uh, technical amendments uh, based off the input from the agency. Um, so I, I'd entertain a, a motion to push this one to our next meeting. Bill draft 134, excuse me. Go ahead, uh, Senator Wasberger. One three four. That's the number. Yep. And then I would ask that um, LSO get with the state agency to work out those issues, and that those issues be addressed within the bill. Okay. Move by Senator Wasper, second by Senator Cost. Any discussion to amend and move forward? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Opposed, say no. That motion carries. And 
a little bit of clarification that that was uh, my mistake. I didn't communicate clearly with our staff. We had to make a second uh, bill draft because um, my intent was not clear. So uh, we'll be sure to uh, coordinate more closely with the, the agency and everybody involved to see if we can get a final project uh, product here. So next up, we have 23 LSO 133 talking about uh, state land leasing and increasing the threshold there for what you have to apply and get approval for. So we'll have another explanation of that bill. Chairman, again, Luke Plum for the LSO. Uh, going through 23 LSO-0133, this is state land leasing, the improvement uh, improvements threshold amendment. So the primary change to this bill is um, throughout this statutory section, any reference to the previous uh, threshold amount for improvements, uh, it was previously $2,000. And so it's been raised to $4,000 in a few key areas. Um, currently, under current statute, a leasee of state lands uh, can construct or make improvements on those state lands in amounts up to $4,000 per section for each separate improvement without per receiving permission. Anything over $4,000 uh, does require an applica application for permission to construct that improvement with the director of OSLI. And um, and is which is subject to whether it's within the best interest of the state. The director has the authority to um, authorize construction of improvements over that amount uh, for separate improvements, such as fencing and water development, livestock handling facilities and range enhancements. Any other type of improvement that would go over that threshold would require a special use permit. But again, it's just raising it from $2,000 to $4,000. And then, um, and, and it's just important to know that yeah, there is also the final section is that improvements uh, within the bill draft, changing it to $4,000. Uh, if you do not receive permission to do that, then you're precluded from compensation under other areas uh, throughout this title um, in, in this section for if you were going to make improvements to state lands. But yes, uh, Chairman, it is just a, a general change to the four thousand dollar mark throughout the throughout this section. I would stand for any questions. Okay, any questions, committee? Okay, pretty straightforward. Concept represent clause. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did we just go with four thousand? Is that like an inflation number, or is that just something we picked? I'm just curious about the number, Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative Clausen. Yes, um, I did look. The last time this was updated was in 1997 uh, when the number was updated. I did just an online inflation calculator and it was just shy of $4,000 is what it would be in 2022. And so that's why we went with the $4,000 mark. Okay, any further questions, committee? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it, Mr. Plum. Okay, hey, Director, welcome back. You, you can sit closer to the front if you want. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, we did do a little research ourselves, and um, it's correct that the last time um, this amount was changed was in 1997. It was changed from $750 to $2,000. Um, we also did sort of a CPI data, um, U.S. government CPI data um, calculation and it, it indicates an 84.6% inflation increase during this time from 97 to 2022. So $2,000 in 1997 equates to, as um, the gentleman indicated, just under 4,000, I think it's like 70 or 3,700. Um, so raising that contributory value um, seems appropriate. The one thing that we were curious about, I think there is a court case um, in which uh, the um, the person did not report the improvement to the board and so the court said that that party would be entitled to the two thousand dollars would be the value of that improvement so i would wonder if there's a benefit in perhaps saying 
you know, moving as of whatever date of the effective date forward, it's 4,000. So there's not a windfall to those who didn't report back when it was 2,000 or some other number. But otherwise, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, now we did have some comment before about the difference of language in paragraph 110 versus 111 in um, paragraph 110 in section five. It's, uh, you know, it's, we, you see, use value of improvements, but then when it comes to 111, which is how you get payment for removal of existing improvements, it's, you know, contributory value. And we actually define contributory value in that paragraph. Do you see there, is there any distinction that's based off of those slightly different terms in the practice, how your office administers this, these provisions? Um, Mr. Chairman, not initially. I'd have to look at that a little more closely, but I think Mr. McGagna testified earlier that that contributory value, it's a little bit confusing, and, and I think we've all done our best to figure out what that means. I'm not sure it's, it's completely clear, but certainly could look at that, um, and if we had further comment, could certainly let the board or let the committee know. Yeah, fair enough. That might be an amendment here, committee, and um, if we so desire to make sure there's consistency between you know those different parts of the statute. But what we choose to be consistent is a policy decision. So, okay. Any further questions for the uh, agency? Okay. Thank you very much. Any public comment? Okay, Ms. McGagna, I'm going to have to ask you to come down and and uh, restate your. Uh, previous testimony here uh, for at least for my benefit and um uh maybe uh, provide your suggestion again for the uh what you think we should be doing if we're going to make this consistent um between the two definitions well thank you mr chairman as i expressed before and i believe the director has indicated defining contributory value is is very challenging it, Supposedly, it makes the the land for that purpose worth that much more money. That's what it contributes, and and that's going to vary by lessee. It's going to vary by so many things. So I believe what, and if I don't have the statute in front of me, am I correct that it's uh, the next section that uses the term contributory value? So if if the value for purposes of needing permission or purposes of reimbursement that's indicated in this section is just market value the or the dep depreciated market value of the improvement then I, I would simply urge you to bring that next section into this bill and change the term contributive value to to uh, reflect current market value or depreciated value whatever what you determine to be the very best terminology to utilize but the intent would be you value the improvement for what it's worth on its own basis and not for what it may or may not contribute to the, the value of the lease. Okay, fair enough. And it looks like just looking on the on our statutes it, in paragraph 111, it says contributory value means the increased value of the property after the lessee's improvements are considered. That's correct. So yes. I'm not sure if that's too helpful. <laughs> well, it, it's, <laughs> it's, very, it's very confusing and, and uh, in the, frankly, it's in the eye of the beholder. Right. Okay. So perhaps something that tied definitively to something that's concrete, like the cost of the materials and labor to construct depreciated cost of depreciated. materials and labor, or something like right. that. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's uh, duly noted. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Any any questions now that I basically forced to come down here? Okay. Never mind. <laughs> any further public comment? Okay, seeing none, anything online? Okay, going once, going twice. Public comment is closed. Committee? Okay. Representative, uh, moved by Representative Blackford, second by Representative Eklund to move the bill for sponsorship. Correct? Yes. Okay, so we have this um, simple enough, I think, uh, policy consideration if we want to add to the bill a more thorough definition of contributory value in both paragraphs. Uh, 110 and 111 committee. I think that's something we can consider at this point is amending the bill. So we can have that added um, change in policy or clarification really, in addition to the increase um, for inflation. So. Okay, okay, go ahead, Mr. Co-Chairman. Okay, Representative Larson, go ahead. 
Mr. Chairman, I'd make an uh, amendment uh, to deal with the is it statute uh, 35111. Is that what it was? I think it is. Okay, that one. <laughs> uh, and I would like to use uh, what uh, Mr. Bengagna had written in his statement, uh, strike contributory, contributory value and insert depreciated value unless a different value is agreed to between the owner of the improvements and the new lessee. Okay, very good. That was uh, got a second. Second by Blackburn, any discussion on that amendment? Okay. Mr. Co-Chairman. Question, Mr. Chairman. Heather, do you, did you figure out how to amend that in? Did you share that with us before we vote? Mr. Chairman, in the materials provided by the Wyoming Stock Grower, Growers Association on their page two, recommendation number three, the recommendation was to, in 36-5-111, to strike contributory value and insert depreciated value unless a different value is agreed to between the owner of the improvements and the new lessee. I believe that that is what Representative Larson moved. Is that correct? Okay, that's on page two of the uh, uh, comments from the stock growers, which I failed to uh, look at before Mr. McGagna came down. So, okay. So that's the motion uh, for the amendment. Any discussion on that? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Any further discussion on the bill? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and do a roll call. Mr. Chairman, this is a roll call vote on 23 LSO 0133 as amended. Senator French excused. Senator Kolb excused. Senator Cost. Aye. Senator Wasserberger. Aye. Representative Blackburn. Aye. Representative Clausen. Representative Fortner. Aye. Representative Heiner. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Western excused. Representative Wharf. Aye. Representative Winter. Aye. Co-Chairman Eklund. Aye. Co-Chairman Boner. Aye. Three excused. Okay, thank you very much. One down, a few more to go. So um, next up we have 23 LSO 71, state land lease coordination. Mr. Chairman, you have before you 23 LSO 71 version working draft working draft 0 0.4. What this bill draft does, um, the committee had expressed in June about the um, the idea of having um, leases be, being able to have taken to um, having it not be done in a vacuum basically when a lease is being renewed. And so what this what this bill draft does is it requires notice and an opportunity to comment on state land leasing applications. So what it goes, the bill draft goes into title 36-3-102 and it inserts a new subsection. And that new subsection indicates uh, a, a, a new duty for the director of, of or, you know, for the Office of State Lands. And that is that when a new application um, for purchasing, leasing, you know, this is any type of new application. It, this is trying to, it's a very broad description because this is in the director's overall duties. Uh, when a new application is received that the, um, the director shall provide notice and an opportunity to comment on the application to owners, lessees, or lawful occupants of adjoining lands. And that way, it's that that way that it's not done necessarily. An action isn't done in a vacuum when there's some new lease that's coming, um, being um, put out there newly for new leasing. And then, when reporting decisions as required under subsection A of this same section, that's another duty of the director. Then the um, director shall include in the report any comments from the owners, lessees, or occupants of adjoining lands. So what this does is it builds some, a procedure in whereby notice is given to the adjoining landowners, and then if there are comments that uh, are pr provided, that those are 
basically taken into account during the process because they are included as part of the notice of, de of reasons for the decision that is already required of the director. And then what occurs in, in the, the rest of the bill on page 236-5-114 and on page 336-6-101, those are basically essentially saying the same thing or, or a very similar thing. Those are just additional leasing sections of Title 36. And um, so they refer that the, um, the first one is the long-term leasing procedures shall require a notice and opportunity to comment. And then the um, the on a the subsection that you see on page three that the rules and regulations that are adopted by the board shall require before a lease is issued or renewed pursuant to the section the notice and opportunity to um, to comment be afforded to the uh, the adjoining adjoining residents and owners. So what this does is it makes it this bill draft makes it part of the director's duties to indicate in its reasons for decision that there there have been you know that what the comments are and then it, it also makes it part of the rules that they need to do it so it, it kind of covers all the bases that the adjoining landowners would have their comments um, have the opportunity to comment and that those comments would be addressed in the throughout the process of, of leasing overall hey any questions for LSO and as a reminder, the idea is to, you know, get some private sector input into this uh, process and hope maybe that help out our state lands personnel. Um, we'll find out if this is helpful or not. So, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're a little bit concerned about the increase in the workload. Um, currently, we average 2,500 to 2,750 separate applications processed per year. Um, it, the wording of the statute requiring us to find owners, lessees, or lawful occupants of adjoining lands, we could probably find the owners in the, um, you know, the, the land records, if you will, but it might be impossible for us to know who the lessees or lawful occupants would be. Um, and as I mentioned, due to the sheer volume of um, leases that we issue, whether it's oil and gas or agricultural or commercial leases, this would be a major workload increase for us. And we think it would cause, um, therefore, a, a big slowdown in our application processing time. And so we, we are concerned about that. So. Any questions for the director? Okay, I've got one. Um, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, down there, Representative Larson, we'll just come this way. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So if we deleted the lease, leases or lawful occupants, it, it makes it better, doesn't it? For you? Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Larson, yes, that cuts down some things. Um, however, still with the sheer volume of leases that we issue, um, we're still gonna have to figure out who the adjoining landowners are. And if you think about 2,500 to 2,750 leases per year, um, that's a significant amount of notification um, related to uh, comments and, and whatnot. There is currently, and I should say this, um, with the board's meetings, um, all of the leases that we're issuing are um, contained on the agenda for the board. Uh, for example, when we have an oil and gas lease sale, um, before we issue those leases, we have to get the board's approval of that oil and gas lease sale. All of those are in a schedule, if you will, or an exhibit as part of a board matter. If people are interested in knowing what leases are being approved, we have um, lease sales um, three times a year. They can go to that schedule and look. And gen while generally these are approved on a consent agenda, if somebody's concerned about something, they can ask to pull that off the consent agenda and make comments so that the board is aware if there's some shenanigans or other issues why they believe that that lease should not be issued. So there's other ways to know about it. Same with you know, ag agricultural leases, um, assignments, everything uh, in our sort of usual course of business for the board meetings, that information is available. And if people go to the website, they can find that out. Representative Fortner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How are other states handling these same problems that we're facing right now? 
have you guys looked in to see how other states are handling these issues or are we just trying to reinvent the wheel here? I know there's a lot of different problems that we've faced in the house as far as bills and stuff that other states has already already went across those moats and they got the good the good things figured out versus the bad things figured out. Uh, have we done that with state state lands it, uh, looking at other states that border us? Have we have we talked to those guys? Have we figured out what the, the parts they got right and the parts that they've got wrong? So we we're, we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Fortner, um, I guess that your question assumes that there's a problem, and I'm un and I'm trying to understand what the problem is. Is it lack of communication about issuance of leases? Is it um, uh, people are perceiving that there might be some shenanigans going on, and they don't feel like they have a voice? I, so I have not specifically looked at those issues with other surrounding states. We can certainly do that and and glean uh, what we can from what other states have done. I just. Um, until I saw the, the bill and some other things, I didn't realize that there were a lot of um, questions and concerns about sort of the day-to-day -day lease issuance. Now, I, I do know, obviously, with certain exchanges and things like that, there, there are concerns that people have, and they bring those to our attention, and we try to um, get, get that information, those comments to the board prior to the board decisions. But the way I'm reading this bill, it would be before issuance of each and every lease be it oil and gas, be it special use lease, the whole gamut. And that's um, such a increase in workload. Obviously we, we would need a full-time staff and then some just to identify the surrounding landowners and that sort of thing. I have not looked at this, um, but certainly my point is, is that there are ways for people to avail themselves of the information and to um, provide comment if in fact there is a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, if, if I were to look into purchasing land with a covenant or a restriction similar similar to this on private property, I would be outraged. I would be, I would be flabbergasted if it had, had a restriction that I had to notify all of the surrounding landowners for anything that I chose to do on that land. It would be taking away property rights of private individuals. So this, it, this is not very different from that with the state land that anything that you would do in the future, if someone came to the state lands and wanted to put a, a post in the ground uh, for a sign or something like that, you would have to notify all of the surrounding landowners because they're receiving, because this individual wanted to put, put a post on state land and receive a benefit. To me, this is outrageous that we, wanted, that we want to require the state to notify surrounding landowners that may not be affected by anything that's going on on the state lands. Now, if it was affecting those surrounding landowners, fine, let's notify them. But the way this reads, anything and everything that we do in the future on state lands, you would have to notify everyone surrounding that state land. And I think this is outrageous. And, and in the form of a question, would you agree? <laughs> Feel free to answer if you want. So. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure I want to answer that, but I, I agree that it's a heavy burden. I also agree that it significantly slows down our ability to be nimble, particularly when it comes to revenue generation on the state trust parcels. I'm not sure many people are going to be excited to even sign up for an oil and gas lease if they know that there's this whole separate comment period that has to go on before the lease is even issued, regardless of whether somebody's complained that there's a problem. So on the one hand, I get it that if people perceive there to be a problem, they want to know what's going on in their backyard. I get all of that. But this is just a very um, burdensome way to get at perhaps more individualized problems. And so along those lines, what would happen if it was just the actual lessee of the state land itself instead of all the neighbors? Um, and so hopefully that would help alleviate some of the administrative uh, burdens as well as the concerns of Representative Heiner. Um, so that's the first question. The second one, what if we took a different approach um, and just had that leaseholder uh, negotiate? Yeah, you know, I always have the option, given the option to negotiate on behalf of the state um, so that, you know, it saved time for your uh, personnel if that negotiation happened in the private sector instead of, um, or at least having that option if it was proved. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have concerns about letting um, the agricultural and grazing lessee take the lead, for instance, with an SU for um, oil and gas facilities. I mean, obviously, not obviously, but in some instances, they may have a dog in the fight, right? We're charged with generating revenue on state trust lands. And so it's up to us to try to, to get the business, if you will. I'm concerned about some of the um, shenanigans that might go on, people steering things away from state lands and onto their private lands, um, or trying to leverage that authority to negotiate on behalf of the state lands um, with respect to other aspects of um, perhaps compliance with the um, Split Estates Act, things like that. So I, I have some concerns with that, not to mention the fact that um, the board and um, OSLI, we have a fiduciary duty to the trust beneficiaries that I don't think we can just assign to a third party. We Our, our interests aren't aligned, if you will. We're, we're still trying to look out for the the um, trust beneficiaries, but also, um, you know, trying to reach accommodation with existing lessees and that sort of thing too. Any further questions, Gary? Okay, thank you, appreciate it. So public comment, uh, Mr. Oldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Pete Obermuller, Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we would have concerns with this bill as well for reasons already stated. Uh, most notably, Representative Heiner uh, it, it hit, hit the nail on the head for, for us. These lands are owned by OSLI. And uh, what the bill seeks to do is, is ask non-owners uh, to uh, you know, essentially weigh in on uh, a lease sale prior to even the lease happening. And the question I would have about that is to what end? OSLI is the one that negotiates the actual lease rates and, and the lease terms uh, uh, for the most part. And, and that is a negotiation between my members and OSLI. What is it that an adjoining landowner would offer other than their personal opinion of how they like or dislike the person that came out to see them or didn't see them or what they feel about a company or something like that? It, it, it does not advance the cause of leasing on state lands, um, uh, nor does it advance the cause of the already difficult situation we face on split estate and the, and the types of, of landowner relationships that we have to deal with. So, uh, 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 at this point, um, I don't think we could support the bill, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for the Petroleum Association? Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Any additional public comment? Mr. McGagna. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we too would not be able to support this bill as broadly as it's drafted right now. A uh, couple of things. I, I think it is important if someone wants to do something, get a permit or lease or anything on state lands that any entity who currently has a permit lease or anything on that parcel of land be notified. And I think that's generally done at least with grazing agricultural lessees. But if that section of the statute needs to be strengthened, we'd certainly be supportive of that. Uh, I think this broader one, particularly when it speaks of owners, lessees, and lawful occupants, piece of land could have 30 lawful occupants that I authorize to be on my land. That, that gets pretty excessive. And the other part that really concerns us, and this kind of goes back to a bill we had two years ago, I believe, that was vetoed by the governor on notice on leases, and that is upon receipt of an application. Uh, there's a point in the process before, particularly on, on purchase of state land, before that goes in front of the Board of Land Commissioners that the public, the neighbors, people need to be able to know. But to require that upon receipt of an, an application before any discussion has taken place with the Office of State Lands as to whether proceeding with this is going to make sense or not, I, I think it's, it's very premature to do it at that point in time and just stifles the opportunity to engage in discussions. So we would urge you not to move forward with this bill. Thank you. Okay, any questions for the stockholders? Okay, I have one. If we were going to attend, once again, the, the thought here um, was to leverage the 
knowledge of market rates for whatever the lease may be that is in the probably in the private sector with that landowner it's also the leaseholder of a, a state parcel is there a method a different method not this one probably but a different method we could attempt to leverage some of that knowledge so to help alleviate the um the, the workload at our state lands office um is it, is my understanding that that was a practice or has been a practice until recently so. mr chairman i apologize i'm not quite understood the first part of your message leverage the knowledge of, of adjacent landowners right or so you say in the context of a of oil and gas development that's what we're thinking about they're already negotiating with that landowner probably with uh, the private lands that are you know surrounding the state parcel for example so there's working knowledge of what the market rate is Certainly, for, and, you know surface damages things like that I, and so that, that's that's the goal is to try to tap into some of that local knowledge if it exists not saying it always does uh, can you think of another method of going about doing that uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I certainly don't think there's anything currently that I would be aware of that would preclude state lands from reaching out to adjoining landowners when they're dealing with a proposal and saying, what you know, what are the rates you're paying? What are you getting? That type of thing. It, it's not disclosing something here. It's seeking information that is shared voluntarily. Uh, I think that can be very helpful. And I'm not aware of any reason that can't be happening today without the need for legislation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, for the public comment. Okay, anything online? Okay, public comment is closed. Committee. Representative Heiner, you do have a motion. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we table this bill. Okay, is there a second? Thank you, Madam Representative, for any discussion. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. That motion carries. This bill is tabled. So, next up, where am I? Doing? We have 23 also 72. Mr. Chairman, I will be going through working draft 0 0.5 of that 72 that you just described. This is state land exchanges, private negotiations. So this bill draft, similarly, but different than the past bill, it requires consideration of comments from users of adjoining lands before approving, affecting, or completing an exchange of state owned, land, state -owned lands for privately owned lands. So this bill draft goes into Title 36-1-110, which is the authority of the director to effect and complete exchanges. And all of page two is existing law and all the only change on that page is that the, there is created the subsection A. And then the new information on page three, the new newly created subsection um, basically requires a showing that the proponent of of lands is not trying to you know get around the split estate or any other requirement that is so, sort of the my summary of a request from the last section and the the mechanism the procedure for doing so is that before approving affecting or completing any exchange of the state-owned lands for privately owned lands the board and the director shall request comments from owners lessees and lawful occupants of adjoining lands and shall consider those comments, all comments that are received at least 20 days before the scheduled action. And that no exchange of the state lands shall be approved, affected, or completed where the privately owned lands are proposed to the state for exchange without the owner of those privately owned lands providing proof that they had some sort of good faith effort to obtain legal permission to use or access the privately owned lands um, as, as, what, as applicable from the owner, lessee, or lawful opponent so this was the statement that basically says uh, the an, an a proponent of a, an exchange can't just be trying to get around the split state um requirement or, or any requirement but can't just propose a, an exchange in lieu of um trying to have some good faith negotiations with surrounding um folks okay thank you any questions about the bill draft then representative Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a little confused over the last the, the last portion of that paragraph. 
uh, uh, privately owned lands uh, must provide proof of good faith effort to obtain legal permission to use. Uh, I, I, I'm not understanding what, what's going on with that statement. Could you give me more granularity and details about what's being said there? Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner. Yes, so the, it, a proponent of state lands wouldn't, as part of their application, basically, you know, they have to prove that yeah, all, all the different aspects that they include in, in an, uh, or in a, and if they're going to propose some state lands be, um, uh, or, sorry, if they're going to propose their lands for exchange, that, that it not be done in, in lieu of having um, negotiated with the landowner. So some sort of, you know, maybe that, I, I don't know, it would, it would be quite fact specific as to what that proof would be, but perhaps the proof would um, be to show that they had some negotiations uh, in this, it, the as applicable is, you know, perhaps it's access to the lands, perhaps they would show in their proponent that they did contact um, the, some of the state or some of the, uh, the the landowners that they're trying to access, they couldn't. And so therefore, and but, but in good faith, they did try to have those negotiations. And so therefore they're in, um, proposing this exchange. Perhaps the, um, the as applicable is quite key here because maybe, maybe access isn't applicable. Maybe what's applicable is um, some sort of use, um, a, 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 some sort of use that, that the proponent of the exchange did talk to surrounding, you know, tried to negotiate in good faith with surrounding folks. Um, uh, let me think of in the example of the of a split estate. Tried to um, tried to negotiate them, but it was at least in contact with the with some of the folks before then saying, "Oh, we can't do this. Let's just go go around that requirement and go directly to ask the state to do an exchange for these lands." So that the the evidence would the type of documented proof. Could be it could differ depending on what the what the use is or what the access is that they're trying to um, that 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 applies to their reason for proposing the lands for exchange. So let me let me put this in context of a private individual who wants to sell his land rather than exchange it. He just wants to sell it to another private individual. In this, this situation, I would, if I wanted to sell a parcel, I would have to go around to all of my neighbors and get their permission to sell my land to uh, make sure that they, they are aware I'm trying to sell it. And uh, it takes away from my rights of, as a landowner. So I'm, I'm not quite understanding that. Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner, I don't think it, um, I, I think that there is a nuanced difference there in that um, the idea is that before going to the state, the, the, the a proponent, the, this, this isn't the state going out there and, and exchanging its land. The, the state isn't the proponent of it. it it's the, it's the, a private individual. And um, rather than saying, oh, you know what? I not even, I want to do this to go around, um, uh, go, to, to, to try to, um, basically to get around requirements that already exist. I'm not even gonna do that process. Instead, I'm just going to say, yeah, here state, you deal with it and, and propose it as an exchange. It's, um, it's, there's a nuanced difference and I need to think for, for a minute for, for how, but we could, um, the, the idea is not to add additional burdens, but to actually kind of um, have a showing of a requirement that the rules were followed before, um, before just, deciding, hey, in, in lieu of that, I'm just going to try to um, have the state, have it become the state's issue. Okay, any further questions, please? Okay, thank you very much. Hey, welcome back, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have a couple of concerns as well. Um, the first one being, again, that um, soliciting comments from owners, lessees, and lawful occupants. Again, we can know who the owners are, but the lessees and lawful occupants, we may not know. 
Um, we don't have a problem with the um, soliciting comments 20 days before the scheduled action. That's not a problem. Those comments can then be turned over to the Board of Land Commissioners. And um, we, we feel like if there were problems going on, people trying to subvert um, statutes and requirements, that that would come out as part of that public comment period and be brought to the board's attention, and that the board could then decide whether to approve or not approve the exchange on those trust land management objectives um, in light of the additional facts going on. Um, the piece we're having a little trouble with here that we're concerned about is that part in which um, it's asking us to make sure that the parties have negotiated access in good faith. Um, first of all, I'm not sure that's OSLI's role. I mean, we're there for revenue generation. We're there to make revenue generation opportunities for the state lands. And this seems like it's putting us in the position to be an arbiter between competing interests over which we may not have a dog in the fight. I mean, our, our interest is obviously to be able to get people to state lands so that they can generate revenue on the state lands. If we can't get people there, we can't generate revenue. And then it's wholly, the, the asset is no good to us, if you will. So this feels like they're asking us to be the referee. Um, things like good faith, um, to me, that's more of a um, a determination by a court, not OSLI, um, but certainly I think we might have trouble um, uh, Im implementing that piece of it. Any questions for the director? Okay, yeah, I'll just, oh, Representative Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How have we done this in the past? Why is it a, a big obstacle right now? Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, I think that some of this has come out of the EOG exchange where I think people are concerned that they don't have enough information about what's going on. They may believe that EOG is trying to utilize the exchange process um, as a way to leverage something um, in their operations. I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I know that there have been um, concerns expressed as we get through um, the exchange process with EOG's application. Um, some of this has been sort of dribbling out and we hope to have more information, but to date, obviously, we have not been asked to be the arbiter of what con constitutes good faith negotiations, and I don't even have detail with respect to the allegations of trying to circumvent, um, you know, the Split Estates Act or anything else, and obviously EOG has a position on this too, um, and they're not here, and I'm not aware of what that position might be, so um, to my knowledge, we haven't really had this issue, at least front and center. Um, before. Thank you. All right, I think that's kind of the, the reasoning behind the bill. We have a very unique land exchange, which um, it, it has never been tried for before in that particular context, I'd say, and uh, it's causing a lot of concern. It's, it's a, and in that context, you know, you hear about, oh, it's not fair to, you know, have, you know, this negotiation go on between the state and the private party. And you know, it's a big question as to who gets to provide input and who doesn't. And I think that's probably how some of the landowners feel when you go from negotiating with a company like that, then all of a sudden the negotiation's off and they're talking to the state of Wyoming instead um, to achieve their goal of owner, owning land in the Power River Basin. Um, that's kind of where we're, you know, struggling to understand what the role the state should play um, when there are those competing interests. And uh, what's the greater context? What's the greater legal context outside of just what inures the best benefit for the state of Wyoming, which I point out in the Constitution also goes on to say, you know, in accordance with the law, right? So, and so we, there's, I think that allows for consideration of other factors that, um, but it seems like this process, the land exchange process is focused exclusively on inuring the greatest benefit right up to the very end um, when we get public comment and so forth. And that just, beyond just a constituent issue from a process perspective, I'm wondering if that's the best use of the state's resources when we have this, what could be a significant factor um, and there's no mechanism to really gather that input or a sample of what that public input may be without compromising the integrity of the exchange. So there's a chicken and egg uh, questionnaire that I think we're trying to get at and I'm not sure that this bill is the best method, but there might be another way of uh, getting at it. So. All of that to say, um, if we were to try a different method, say uh, some more guidance as to 
uh, the state land should prioritize exchanges that meet certain criteria, such as it's within the same county or within 100 miles of, you know, the lands are within 100 miles of each other, if they increase public access, if they consolidate land ownership patterns. So it's not a hard and fast prohibition against any land exchange, but we're simply saying we're going to prioritize ones which are likely to be less controversial. Um, that could be a, a bill we move forward potentially in addition to maybe having some opportunity for if there is input, say, from elected officials in the affected area. So there's some limits. Um, so not anybody can provide input, but, you know, somebody or group of people who are, say, elected officials that could uh, provide some uh, perspective as to what the public a reaction may be without compromising the details of the exchange um, and have that be presented in an executive session, for example. Um, I think all these are all things that maybe we could do to help the process, uh, potentially, maybe this bill isn't, but um, what would your be your, your reaction to the, either of those two possibilities? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I completely agree that there has to be another way to get the information cold out, if you will, um, before things get too far down the path. And we're certainly willing to work with you and the committee to figure out what that right balance is, because also, as we've talked, you know, you don't want the information out there too soon. So then you can have the shenanigans of people playing games and driving prices up and all that. Um, with respect to prioritizing um, blocking up lands and things like that, we're already doing that. If we look for those opportunities, and of course, our exchange program as such right now, um, we're not actively seeking exchanges for all those reasons that Deputy Crowder mentioned earlier. We don't want people to think we've got our eyes on their private land and things like that. So some of that is dependent upon what we receive in the door, but we do um, look for opportunities to block up land for um, you know, hunting and recreating and accessing and all of those things. But I do agree with you um, that there's gotta be a, a better way to get more information out. And so be happy to work with you moving forward. I'm not sure this gets you there, but um, the we are happy to do that um, notice piece 20 days before an action would be taken. Um, certainly happy to implement that. We think that is definitely something we could do. And, and just to be clear, so I understand, Director, that when you say before any scheduled action, that would be, say, for example, the board's decision to move on to category two, for example. Um, what, what what qualifies as an action? I guess, Mr. Chairman, what I read that to be is before um, the final matter was before the board for final approval. Um, Deputy Director Crowner and I, we've tried to figure out ways in the process, you know, when it gets to CAT 2 and then it goes to the board in executive session and they um, talk about it and then they bring it out and bring it as a walk-in matter to the next board meeting. You know, perhaps there's some time in there to get further comment or to bring other interests to the table to tell us what we think. I need to kind of flesh that out a little bit, but perhaps there's something there we can do because it's going to become public anyway as part of the, the board's um, public meeting, their usual course of business. So um, perhaps we can get our heads together and think about other ways to, to get at it. I agree it's important. Okay, any questions, me? Representative Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dep uh, Director, you, you're supportive, uh, let me just be clear, you're supportive of this if we remove the lessee and lawful occupants from that paragraph, so it just says com solicit comments from owners of adjo adjoining lands, is that correct? Um, Mr. Chairman, what I'm supportive of is the, the piece about, you know, before approving um, an exchange, you know, before the actual action is taken, that we would um, notify and solicit comment from owners of adjoining lands, um, and that those comments would be received 20 days prior to a final agency action, so the board could take all that into consideration. Um, that's that's my interpretation of it. If the um, committee has a different one, then perhaps we should talk further. But we don't have an objection to notifying folks at least 20. You know, the those that are. Um, adjoining landowners, but we just can't figure out who the lessees and the lawful occupants might be. Any further questions, committee? Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Director. Mr. Chairman. Okay, public comment, Mr. Obermiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, one more time. Uh, Pete Obermuller, Petroleum Association of Wyoming. A couple of comments about this one. First of all, 
Um, uh, let me just mention that is my role representing the uh, the entire oil and gas um, industry in Wyoming. I'm not here to speak on behalf of any one company and their particular exchange. Uh, that's an issue for them and for OSLI and, and yourself and all of the other interested stakeholders uh, to work out. My interest in this is to make sure that um, a process still exists where land transfers are still viable and could still happen uh, uh, in the state of Wyoming. Uh, following all the rules and, and, and procedures necessary to make that happen. So uh, to that end, uh, the bill in front of you, uh, in, in my opinion, has some trouble. Um, at the most basic level, starting on line six uh, and following, that starts with no exchange of state-owned lands. Mr. Chairman, that's a 66-word run-on sentence that all of us sitting here today might understand the context of it. I would defy anyone who doesn't know what's going on maybe five, 10 years down the road to have any idea what that sentence says. So at, the, at, at a minimum, if we're gonna go down this road, we, we need to make clear what, what, what you're trying to do here. Um, now, having said that, um, I have similar issues uh, regarding the proof of owner's good faith effort to obtain legal permission to use. Mr. Chairman, that's a very thorny issue. Uh, it's it's thorny even for the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, uh, who deals with uh, these sorts of issues um, uh, on a much more regular basis than OSLI. And of course, Director Scoggin also serves on, on Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, so she knows how that looks. And the issue of what is a good faith negotiation is uh, in the eye of the beholder. And the fact of the matter is a uh, good faith negotiation on, on oil and gas leases or anything else uh, in Wyoming in the Powder River Basin uh, is quite frankly a two-way street. Two people have to be sitting at the table and actually talking about this and for, for it to work. Now, do I have there been uh, instances where oil and gas companies have not argued in good faith? Sure. And in fact, district courts have swatted them down for that. Have there been instances where landowners do not operate in good faith and negotiate in good faith? Yes that actually exists too. And I know that's a hard pill to swallow because we like to think that doesn't happen, but it actually does for lots of reasons, maybe legitimate and sometimes not, but you have to have both people at the table to do that. And at the end of the day, uh, uh, simply not getting everything that you've asked for does not indicate bad faith on the part of the other party in both directions. And so having, in order to determine what is good faith, you have uh, the court has to go through some significant fact finding in order to, to in order to to say yes or no to either side on good faith negotiations. And if the exercise today is to maximize OSLI's time given their workforce constraints, doing that fact finding mission is a profoundly bad idea. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, that part of course gives me gives me great pause. Uh, I'm happy to, add, to answer any other questions about uh, uh, land exchanges, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Any questions for the Patrolman Association? Representative Fortner. Pete, how is the other land or other states handling this same issue? You get around and you, you see the big picture. Uh, how are they doing it? Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, it, it it's so situational. Uh, Wyoming is, uh, there's some of this that happens in North Dakota. They have a little bit of, uh, of BLM, but they do not have it to the extent we do. And uh, we're, we're in a pretty, we're in a unique position here that's not favorable to anyone. Uh, and, and that's how much split of state we have. Uh, we just, we have that issue more than any other state, particularly the private land states, of course. Uh, and, and so that, uh, that presents challenges for us. And it's, elevated for us because the Powder River Basin is where our growth potential is, and that's where the split of state issues are. So we have 25 rigs running in the state right now, 15 of them are in the Powder River Basin. If we want oil and gas to continue to develop and grow, it's gonna to have to be there. And it's gonna to have to be with, uh, with corporations, small and large, uh, you know, don't forget that 85% of oil and gas operators in Wyoming are small mom and pops. Um, all of those operators are going to have to work with the landowners and vice versa to make sure that our 
our sweet spot for oil and gas continues to develop. So, you, you, you know, other states have different rules, but I would tell you that they, um, um, none of them are better than the others. They all require a certain amount of negotiation. Uh, in split estates, we're required to negotiate, and then there's ways to bond on, et cetera. Um, even in the case of, of a transfer like this, the road, the Private Road Act still requires negotiation for access before action can take place. Uh, uh, so it's all um, uh, that those restrictions are there with the backstop, of course, that this is our this is our prime oil and gas development area. Question. Uh, I know last meeting we talked in June, you said that taxes is higher in Wyoming for oil, coal, and gas extraction business. Uh, you see that as a hobble in the future as far as being competitive, like you just talked in North Dakota and places like that. Uh, are we still, with the higher taxes, are we still going to be in the playing field in the big picture? Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, yeah, I mentioned it this morning before. It's just a... Uh, um... It is a fact of life of doing business in Wyoming that our tax rates are higher than our competitive states. Uh, now, um, uh, you will hear arguments that you know say that taxes don't really matter. It's all about whether or not the resources here that matters, and that is true. Certainly, uh, we have we have a desirable resource in Wyoming, uh, and uh, companies are going to want to access that. Uh, but it does play a role in terms of capital deployment. Um, it, you know, and, and all of this comes together in terms of the federal lands, the challenges of split estate, our tax, uh, uh, our tax regime, et cetera, play into capital expenditure decisions. Comment. I, as well as everybody else that works in the extraction industry out there, particularly oil, we want to thank you for doing what you do for the state of Wyoming. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. It's really the, the 12,000 men and women who go to work every day in the oil fields that deserve the thanks. Uh, I'm just here speaking on their behalf because they're doing real work. Okay, any further questions? Okay, well, I appreciate your testimony, Mr. Obermiller. I'm Thank sure you, we'll Mr. be Chairman. discussing uh, other options moving forward to make sure that um, now we're prioritizing our staff time and yeah, we'll see how that goes. So. Okay, any further public comment? Mr. McGagney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we would be very supportive of the first sentence in that uh, proposed language lines one through six with two changes. The one suggested by the director of striking less season lawful occupants and the other one just for clarification purposes where it says of adjoining lands I would suggest of lands adjoining the state parcels. So it's not confused that you need to inform landowners adjoining the private lands that are being offered. It's just a, a technical correction there. As to the second part, line six through 13, I have to admit to being totally confused. As I read that, and I've read it many times, it's saying that someone would be offering lands to the state that don't have legal access. And my first question is, why would the state in its interest be willing to acquire a parcel of land that has no legal access? If that's, if that's the correct reading of it, it, it seems to me that that, that section is, is unnecessary because just the obligations of the, the board and the state land office are such that they're not going to acquire a piece of land with no legal access. So I have Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the stock growers? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Any further public comment? Okay, nothing online, it looks like. So. Public comment is closed. Committee discussion. Motion, Representative Heiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion to uh, make the changes as outlined by by Mr. McGagna. And oh, that, are, sorry, are you going to move the bill? Or I'm sorry. Are you looking to move the bill or? Uh, Yes, I did say that. No, I, and I, it's I know, I know I did. Okay, but uh, and just before we. Um, get going to, I guess, have a little discussion here, how we want to proceed. There's the other concept of having, you know, 
statutes that prioritizes certain land exchanges over the other. Um, sounds like that's sort of a common practice, but there's an opportunity to provide additional guidance there. I didn't know what the committee's appetite would be to sponsor a bill such as that. And perhaps um, this could be um, incorporated into that bill as well. Um, um, so the committee's pleasure, whether we want two separate bills sort of dealing with this land exchange uh, issue, or whether we just want a single one that kind of uh, gets everything together. Um, and so whatever you want to do, committee. Sorry to interrupt, Representative Hunter. You move the bill? Hey, Chairman, go, I, go ahead and move the bill if you'd like. I, I, yeah. I moved and we moved okay. the bill. Okay. All right. Second. Okay. Any discussion or amendments? I, uh, is it time for an amendment? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I propose that we amend the bill as, as suggested by Mr. McGagna in that we delete. Uh, lines 6 through 13, beginning with no exchange. We also delete uh, on line um, line 4, lessees and lawful occupants. And the third thing was uh, uh, clarifying adjoining lands, as he outlined on line 4, adjoining lands of state land i believe it was right yes. yeah th we yeah. got the concept well the word smith as necessary but i think that's pretty clear yes. that's that's uh, my motion okay is there a second okay seconded by representative Clausen. okay oh uh mr Jarvis, go ahead mr chairman so the um the notice does not go to any people adjoining the parcel that will become the states, only to the one that is the states that would be um, being exchanged. I believe it's for the owners, not the lessees or lawful occupants, but only the owners of lands directly bordering the state parcel. Only the state parcel and not the parcel that will become the states. I'm just trying to clarify. So, because right. this would be the if we're talking about two parcels and if it, if we make the change that says to um um sorry lands adjoining the state parcel but that's the parcel that's going away not the parcel that will become the states okay uh, is that yeah. correct so representative Hunter, you want to clarify whether it's just one uh, side of the exchange or should it be both i think it should be both okay very good in in that case, Mr. Chairman, so that there then it would remain as it is. Yes, I, I I'd like to change my amendment and, and just leave it as it is on the adjoining lands, meaning both parcels. Yeah, I'm sure if we need to clarify that it's not just any land in the general facility, they have to be actually bordering that. I think that was the concern. And so just we'll double check, make sure that's exactly the way it needs to be. And uh, but yeah, I think the concept's still clear. So okay, any discussion on that amendment? So Mr. Chairman, can we uh have staff read the amendment as we proposed? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I think that it would be beneficial to read how it would read, I think. So this would be a subsection B that would say, before approving, this is if it, with all these amendments, before approving, affecting, or completing any exchange of state-owned lands for privately owned lands, the board and director shall solicit comments from owners of lands adjoining the parcels to be exchanged. How about that? of lands adjoining the parcels to be exchanged and shall consider all comments received at least 20 days before the scheduled action. And Heather, we're, we're delayed leaving page three 
line six from no on. Mr. Chairman, Representative um, Blackburn. Yes, it would end where I just ended this sentence. I believe that's not my dictate. That's what I understand all the amendments to be. Thank you. You good, Representative? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any further discussion or questions? Yes. I, some over there. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. no. Okay. That motion fails. Okay, any uh, any further discussion? Okay, so do you, you call for the Div you see mean division? You call for division. Okay, so division is being called on that motion for the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, raise your hand. One, two, three. Okay, all those opposed? Two, three, four, five. Okay, so that fails three to five. Okay. Okay. Well, gotta be sure. Okay, any further discussion on this bill, which currently stands unamended? Um, so the motion, I believe, was to sponsor as a committee bill. And, okay, so we'll call the roll. Mr. Chairman, this is roll call vote on 23 LSO 0072 state land exchanges and private negotiations. Senator French excused. Senator Kolb excused. Senator Cost. No. Senator Wasserberger. No. Representative Blackburn. No. Representative Clausen. Aye. Representative Fortner. No. Representative Heiner. No. Representative Larson. No. Representative Western excused. Representative War. Representative Winter. No. Co Chairman Eklund. No. Chairman Boner. Ten no's. Okay, so that Three. bill, uh, that motion fails. So, uh, committee, I, I think we do have another concept I'd like to, you know, Eric, if anybody has a motion, you know, another bill draft going to prioritize uh, land exchanges that meet the following criteria. One, um, they're within the same uh, county. Two, they're uh, increased public access. Or three, uh, they consolidate land ownership. And that'll just be a starting point. Of course, we can discuss that list um, as needed at our next meeting. That'd be the starting point for it. Um, and so is there a motion for that, that bill draft to get that going? Okay. So it's simply given direction of state land to prioritize land exchanges that meet any one of the following criteria. The first one is if it's within the same county. The second one is if it increases public access. The third one is if it consolidates land ownership patterns. If it increases public access. Yes, so that was the second one. And the third one was if it consolidates land ownership. So if you have like a 30 acre parcel somewhere, it's just in the middle of nowhere, you can do a land exchange to even up the, the borders. Okay. No second. Okay, moved by uh, Representative Wharf, second by Representative Blackburn. Any discussion on that bill? Yeah. Before we go to see it. Okay. <laughs> oh, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. What? What? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, on the third criteria, criterion is um, consolidate land ownership for the state or for the proponent or just Let's do either consolidate. one for now. Pardon? So, I, either one for now. And, okay. Yeah. yeah. Either one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, sorry. Let, let's have that. Let's try to get any further discussion. Please. Question. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Okay, that motion carries. And finally, we have 23 LSO 70. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman, this is 23 LSO 70, as you said, and it is working draft 0 0.4. What this bill draft does is at its broadest level, and I'll go into the more micro level in a moment, but it transfers the grants and loans uh, programs and the administration of all of the grants and loans that OSLI currently administers. It translates the or transfers the administration of that over to the Wyoming Business Council. And okay, so um, the first page is the specific specifies kind of the the specifics of that that it um, it reorganized the administration of the grants and loans and that it provides that Wyoming Business Council administers them that are currently the grants and loans that are currently administered by the OSLI and that um, that the transfer of the grants and loans functions it take it, it, it takes care of that. And the functions, fun, functions, funding, functions, funding, positions, property, equipment, and other authority. That's some language that comes from the different types of transfers. If the committee is familiar, there's different. Um, there's title type one transfers, type two transfers, and things. A type two transfer is the kind that transfers functions, and um, but the, it needs to be part of the plan if those other things are uh, transferred. So that it will become part of this bill draft. And then there's some conforming statutory changes. And then there are also there's some rulemaking things that needed to be addressed simply because the business council um, has some specific specifics in its rulemaking that are different than some of the grant and loan programs. So that was all that I was just giving some background on it based on the the title that was on page one. Now, starting on, on page two, the the bill draft. Um, goes in these these are the different sections and um let me back up also many grants and loans that are in statute they specify that slib shall administer them so if slib oh, this sorry the state um, loan and investment board and by virtue of the fact that previously to this bill or well currently but then if this bill were to pass OSLI is the administrator of the SLIB loans, that then therefore that's how they are administered. But there was no actual statutory change required because the, the statutes refer to the state loan and investment board. And so, and and then whoever whoever does the administration for SLIB is who would administer the grant loan. So that therefore some, there's many loans that if you were to go out to the um, Office of State loans or state lands and investments website they have a grants and loans section and they list all kinds of their different loans um, many of those in statute refer to slip so the changes that are in this bill draft are are the they they address the situations where the osli um, or the director um, is specifically um, singled out as the administrator otherwise there, there's the broad administration, which we'll deal with very um, soon, right here on page two. And this is where it says the Office of State Lands and Investments, the director, at one of the in the structure there. It, this is where it had said that the off, that the director um, shall administer all programs of the Board of Land Commissioners and the State Loan and Investment Board. With, so this goes in and makes the amendment and all programs except grants and loans of the State Loan and Investment Board. So basically, that would mean what what that leaves is the the investments and and other state lands matters rather than the grants and loans, but that that is a even though it's just a, kind of one partial line on page two, that's kind of the effective uh, one of the effective parts of this bill draft, and then um, we're going on and continuing to the uh, the council, which is the. Um, oh, sorry, in nine nine twelve one oh four now we're switching to the business council and. This is the part, just uh, it feels like I'm jumping ahead because we haven't addressed some of the other loans, but this is where in statute numerically from you know smallest to largest, where the business council's um, uh, requirements for rules are. And many uh, grants and loans have specific rules for the SLIB as far as what it, how it needs to, or sorry, many of the statutes 
indicate specifically how the, the SLIB is supposed to administer those and how it's supposed to promulgate rules. So therefore the change that's on page three, where it says that any rule, the insertion, is that any rule promulgated for a grant or loan of the SLIB shall be promulgated pursuant to the Wyoming Administrative Procedure Act or pursuant to the state loan, the SLIB's rulemaking authority that's specified for that particular grant or loan program because some of the different loan programs have different requirements. And then, so that that is the real part. And then there is added in the same uh, section that has to do with the Wyoming Business Council, there is added a subsection C as one of the powers and duties of the council. It's the, the line right there on line 18 of page three, the council shall administer all grants and loans of the state loan and investment board. So those two pages on pages two and three are what transferred it in statute, basically the administration of these grants and loans. Then the rest of the bill, starting with page four, are that the the uh, on starting on page there there's a statute in title 11 which are some that's those are some ag loans and they had referred specifically to the director of the office of state lands and investments so there's a change made there to uh, refer instead to the chief executive officer of the wyoming business council and then they're still on some of these ag loans in title 11 on page five there was a reference to os the lie so it changed change to WBC. I'm going to just go with the acronym or the initializations if that's okay with y'all. Okay, then when and 16 at the bottom of page five, those are infrastructure projects and street and road projects. And again, they referred to OSLI, so it switches to business council. Then on page five, this is um, on some drinking water uh, grants and loans. And again, there was a reference to Office of State Lands and Investments. And there was also a definition that um, that said the office of state, or I think it said office shall mean the the OSLI, and so we insert the definition. Wyoming well, Business Council means the business council that was created in the statute, and then just to there there is a section two that's on page nine that repeal just to I, I look at it now just because that it repealed the same the same definition in this title 16 that had uh, defined that osli is the osli that's created on whatever its creation pages that's the, that's the repealer on line 13 of page nine back to page four we're continuing in in these um drinking water loans with a reference to osli and wbc same with all of page seven and page eight. And then on page nine at the top, there's another loan that had referred to, and these are student dormitory capital construction loans, and they had referred to OSLI. So there's the switch to the business council. Then the bulk of this bill draft, and simply just because of the way of amending prior um, session laws, bottom of page nine, uh, the entirety of section three, we need to go in um, and specify that from your last session, there were there were so, uh, some loans. This was the Senate file 66, which was the, um, the special money. What was the special money? Pardon? There we go, the ARPA money. <laughs> it's like, oh, we've heard this a million times and I just forgot the name of it. The section three, which is the bottom of page nine all the way through um the top of pay or all the way through basically page 18 so all those pages is bringing in those two sections to simply to make the change that you'll see that's at the top of page 11 where in the appropriation on pages on page 11 lines 10 11 and 12 it had the code for the osli which was 060 that's what that agency number is for the budget and 085 is the agency number for the business council. So that is the change made. And then the other change, even though all these pages are brought in, are on pages um, 13 and 14, where it said OSLI, and it was um, it would be stricken to say Wyoming Business Council. Okay, so now jumping to page 18 at the very bottom is a section four, and this is the the just the 
kind of the instructions about the grant that the, on July 1st, 2023, the grant and loan functions within the Office of State Lands and Investment are transferred in this type two transfer that I mentioned before um, to the Wyoming Business Council and that the positions, personnel, property and appropriated funds associated with administration and operations of the grant and loan programs or functions shall be transferred accordingly. And, and then um, the subsection B, any contracts or, or you know any obligations that already existed, they won't be um, affected by this act. And then also the, the subsection C is that the, the governor may authorize um, any changes between now and when, when things take effect to, uh, to, make, uh, to allow this transfer to happen. And then subsection D, which is on page 20, that the, this is same, some additional um, the authority to the governor to make the, these um, this transfer happen. And then page five, which is on, sorry, section five, which is on page 21, uh, is the requirement that the business council should promulgate any rules necessary to implement this act. That's the subsection A. And then I note on line four, there's an A, but it should be a little B, um, is that conf conflicting rules of the, the OSLI that already exist, they shall be of no force and effect upon adoption of rules by the WBC that are necessary to implement this act. And then finally, section six at the bottom of page 21 is the split effective date that allows those rules to be promulgated before all of the set statutory things take effect. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions, committee? Uh, Senator Cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm on page 11 where we've changed from OSLI to 85. Um, if this goes into session and goes into effect, um, that money, I believe, some of that's starting to happen already. Um, is that gonna hold some of that up? What's gonna be the situation there because of the timeline on when that money is no longer available. Mr. Chairman, Senator Cost, one would hope things could be seamless <laughs> uh, in a change, but in the idea is on page 19, starting at line 14, the, valid the validity of current and past rules, regulations, contracts, agreements, or other obligations of agencies or programs transferred by this act is not affected. So one would hope I, you know, if there could be glitches, who knows, but if one would hope, the idea is that it would go, it just, the, the, there would be the transfer of administration, not, you know, subtracting someone's loan or something under, under those footnotes, 16, 17, and 18, which were the ones that were addressed by the, the in that section or in those sections of the budget or of that bill draft or bill. Uh, so basically we should be safe with this because a lot of this money would be done in 26 and this cuts the time a lot closer if they wait i'm just wanting to make sure that we're protecting what's been done already and what will i know i heard it but i just wanted to make sure that it's it is correct mr chairman senator cost in addition the governor has given some authority in those subsections c and d to um to be able to facilitate the reorganization that is in this act, to be able to um, move things as needed to be able to make it, in theory, happen seamlessly. <laughs> Any further questions, please? Okay, thank you for the explanation. All right, last time for today, Director. Probably. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of concerns. The main one, um, timing's everything, right? My biggest concern would be the transition of all the ARPA work that we're doing right now. Currently, we have, I'll get the numbers right for you, 121 water and sewer applications totaling $253 million. 
81 health and human services applications totaling over $200 million. We're getting ready to launch the local government pot of the program um, this fall. Right now, um, we're in the process of evaluating the applications that we do have in for health and human services and water wastewater for completeness. Um, we're hoping to be able to get all those evaluated um, with our sister agencies, Department of Health, um, Water Development, um, DEQ. Uh, we're hoping to ha start having some meetings where the SLIB would start maybe awarding some of those funds this fall. Um, my concern is, is that any kind of movement uh, in the um, uh, might impact some of that with respect to, you know, we always want to be correct in our accounting and our keeping track and all of that and sort of changing horses in the middle of the stream, if you will, um, may impact our ability to um, be as um, complete and as accurate as we'd like to be. Also, after the awarding of the funds is done, then it comes the grant agreements where we're, we are managing that on the back end with those successful applicants. Um, that takes a significant effort, of, um, and it's not just our grants and loan staff. We have additional staff that helps with that. Um, and then our reporting on the back end, that's very important, the reporting component to the federal government. Um, all that aside, we also are expecting additional funds to the IIJA, which are the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, that would be money coming into the SRF programs, which are the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. Um, those are pretty complicated programs, and it takes a lot to understand them and get up to speed. Um, I've talked to Director Parfit, and we kind of feel like we've got a pretty good gig going, if you will, where everybody knows their roles and understands the program, and we all work very well together, as we do with water development. Um, with that said, the other piece that is um, concerning is, you know, the impacts to um, to ARPA and IIJA and all of that, but also um, the compatibility with the um, business council. You know, business council they do grants and loans of their own, but with a different lens. They're more in line with economic development. Our programs are more focused on a wide range of. Um, programs with various eligible entities, um, you know, a lot of local gov local governments. Um, we deal with transportation issues, student dormitories, municipal and solid waste facilities, countywide consensus grants, capital construction, and then again, the water and sewer, as I mentioned. So um, anyway, just uh, worried about the compatibility with that. Um, I've also been told, and I don't know this for certain, but there could be impacts on, to the annual financial statement reporting. Understand the business council is a component unit of the state, um, whereas OSLI, our grant loan programs are reported as part of the state's annual comprehensive financial report. So there might be some additional investigation with the auditor's office with respect to what that would look like moving forward. Um, also, if uh, the grant and loan programs are in fact moved out of OSLI, it's unclear what OSLI's continuing role even is with the SLIB currently. You know, we're the staff and we get the board meetings and we receive the board matters and get everything out for the board. Um, really, our role has been um, with respect to the grants and loans, that's the whole reason we've administered um, the, the slip meetings and that sort of thing. And without those, I don't know if we have a role. I don't know if that would need to transfer to the business council then to run those um, slip meetings. Um, and, and then I guess finally, my hope would be um, that if we are successful in getting additional employees to help manage the state trust lands, that things can kind of stay where they are, just simply moving um, the... Um, the SLIB programs or the grant loan programs to the business council without any additional um, employees to help manage the trust lands doesn't help me manage trust lands anymore. So um, with that, Mr. Chairman, um, those would be my concerns with it and be happy to stand for any questions. Okay, thank you, Director. Any questions? Representative Hyman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, what kind of an impact would this uh, piece of legislation have on your personnel? Uh, how many people would need to be transferred over to the Wyoming Business Council and what, uh, how much of your budget would also be transferred? Uh, just give me a feel, give us a feel of what, how significant that would be to your organization. 
Mr. Chairman, Representative, I don't have those figures in front of me. I can certainly get those figures with respect to budget um, impacts. Um, Employee-wise, we're probably looking at five or six employees, plus we are um, in the throes of trying to hire some part-time um, consultants, if you will, to help us with the ARPA piece of that. Um, but it, it will impact. We do have various software programs that are licensed through OSLI um, specifically for um, SLIB programs that would then have to be dropped and moved to the business council. I'm not sure what financially that would look like, but I can certainly get that information to um, this committee. So what would, just an, a round number estimate, what would it cost to transfer all of this, this uh, responsibility over? Because it's, it, it's not just a, a paper transfer. You're actually moving people. You're actually, software may have to be relocated or repurchased. What, what would it cost just for this piece of legislation? Again, Mr. Chairman, I don't have those numbers at my fingertips, but it I would guess it would be significant moving people to business council, all of their computers, um, you know, the, the licenses that they have, uh, the budget for employees. Um, I can get that information, but I, I'm, I'm sorry, I do not have it with me right at this time. Last one, Mr. Chairman, thank you. <laughs> and more than likely, it would slow down some of the grants uh, that we're already working on through the ARPA. Many of our communities and uh, towns are are relying on these grants or hoping for these grants. Uh, it took it took your department a while to to promulgate the rules, so this would would probably slow that process down quite a bit as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, yes, I believe it would. Um, as I mentioned, we're sort of right in the middle of the first round of applications for um, the water sewer and the um, health and human services pots of money. We have yet to um, launch the program for the local governments, but certainly with um, the timing of all this, uh, it could Im impact that in a negative way. I'm afraid things are gonna drop through the cracks and potentially even delay some of the funding decisions and the grant applications on the back end, just trying to get everybody moved over. Um, it, it could impact the timing for all of that. And, and obviously we're concerned about timing of getting the funds out because there's limited time period within which to um, commit them and utilize them. Any further questions, Senator Koss? I've already alluded to it a little bit, but I'm real concerned about the ARPA funds and the amount that uh, those grants have been, uh, we'll say, thoroughly in, in, uh, reviewed by you guys and made decisions. And when they go to the business council, either you guys are gonna have to tell them how you made those decisions or they're gonna have to figure it out. So there's some kind of continuity there. Um, I'm real concerned about what that means for the holdup for all of the ARPA fund. And on top of that, with that timeline getting closer and closer to when those have to be completed. I think this is uh, definitely one part that would really be, uh, I guess, uh, impacted quite a bit. Uh, you said pretty much, but is that pretty well sum it up? Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Koss, um, yes, I think that pretty much sums it up. And I think that's my concern too. At this point, um, you know, we've got a, a really good staff that they're on top of things. We're reviewing and evaluating things. We're hoping to make recommendations for funding and get the money moved out. And I'm just concerned about the delays that might be incurred with um, this sort of move. Any further questions? Representative Fortner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The clean water part of this funding is, is what bothers me. Uh, has anybody traced these these grants back to see what kind of strings attached to our clean water systems here in Wyoming if we use that money? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Fortner, yes, we have a list of um, all of those federal requirements that come with it, you know, Davis-Bacon, U.S. Iron and Steel, all of those, uh, and some of it uh, depends upon the programs. Um, so we'd be happy to get you with the right people to understand the nuances of the different um, pots of money if, if that's something you're interested in. Yeah, I would like that. If you could do that, please. Thank you. Any further questions, please? Okay. Thank you, Director. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, we also have the Business Council here or online, potentially. Uh, 
Okay, right. Okay, Mr. Durrell, welcome to the Agriculture Committee. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair and uh, members of the, the committee. Um, I believe Director Scoggin summed it up pretty well uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, just uh, I can give you my perspective if, if you'd like on this. Is that, uh, is that where we are? I, I wasn't able to hear you very well. Any questions, committee? Okay, thank you for the succinct uh, testimony there. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, please proceed. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, yes, Mr. Co-Chair, I'm, I'm sorry. I was unable to really kind of hear that. And I I think uh, I think Director Scoggin did a really good job of laying that out and saying uh, part of the, the challenges that, that that would be faced by any agency. And as, as I see it, it looks like a liftoff uh, out of one um, agency into another. And all those challenges would remain, except that more challenges for two reasons, as, as she mentioned, the transition is a big challenge. That's not a simple thing. Uh, that's just never simple organizationally. Um, but the other challenge, and I think this is probably more important for uh, my, my team's focus on uh, economic development in the state, is that it would take away from the economic development uh, capacity that we have in the state because we'd have to learn a completely new program. We'd have to integrate it into our systems and really integrate it into uh, perhaps even our board structure and all of that. So it, in my mind, uh, it takes us away from a focus that we're really um, bearing down on some really big answers and we're doing some great things. And so to take our focus away from that um, for uh, to, to learn something completely new when an agency that already has it and understands it um, it's, it's, that's a big challenge that I think needs to be considered uh, carefully. Uh, with that, I'll stand for any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, sir. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Appreciate your perspective. Uh, stand by if we have any more questions. Uh, Heather, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I um, as I was going through the bill draft, there there was actually one part of the bill draft that, that I kind of... Um, skipped over because I was eager to get to the next part, but there is at the top of, um, there are two key aspects that the committee would need to be aware about, aware of, and and it and it, this is a significant part as Director Scoggin and um, Director Durrell just were saying that at the top of page four, um, there uh, in subsection A of, of the 9-12-105, which is the talking about the, the services that the business council does, uh, there, there was the insertion that needed to be the insertion to expand their roles but from their economic development um, focus. And, and they both have come, come, talked about that, that that expansion is not insignificant. And I did in fact, um, skip over that as I was going through the bill. And um, it, there's an, an additional factor that talking about um, the, that, that, that is not in the bill draft, but the, the committee is most likely aware, but there are also differences between OSLI and WBC insofar as that the director of OSLI is appointed by the governor and WBC, the, the, uh, um, the CEO of the WBC is um, not, he's, he's appointed by the board. Now the board is with, with the is appointed by the governor or, and with the advice and consent of the of the senate but there is that separation and they and the wbc is in fact a um a, a separate body corporate that um it in there is the possibility that it could jeopardize its status as a separate body corporate which has all kinds of reasons for them being a separate instrumentality to then get into this in, into this situation of administering things for the health, safety, and general welf welfare of the people of the state. And um, so while I focused on the, the function of what the bill did, there are some uh, di significant differences that we could discuss between the two if we need to be. Okay, thank you. That's important uh, clarification. Um, so uh, we'll open up to public comment. Looks like we have at least one online representative Sweeney, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in my mind, a lot of this, the ship has already sailed on um, what, what the intent of it, that it looks like on this bill. And 
Um, on page two, the new language on line 19, programs accept grants and loans, the state loan and investment board transferring as has previously been reviewed um, is no simple matter. Um, and then I, I, on page four, I was gonna bring your attention to what Heather just went through. You're adding a new mission uh, to the business council and they've worked really hard the last three dash four years since Josh has come on board um, strategically looking at their mission and redeveloping and redefining. And they're just getting finally to that, that point in implementing. Um, and now here the legislature comes in and wants to add another additional mission. Um, my next notes are really back on page, um, uh, page nine. Uh, with this, with the new section two, um, and and the language which is basically out of what the rules around the ARPA Direct uh, are on expending. So March twenty seventh on line twenty four, March twenty seventh, twenty twenty two, and ending December thirty first, twenty twenty six unless otherwise specifically provided the conditions, terms, and other requirements on the appropriations in this act are effective until December 31st in 2026. So um, what that's saying is we, the legislature already accepted these funds um, and uh, they are in play and uh, and we, as the legislature, went through, uh, and you can really see this uh, on page 10, um, with the breakdown going at the bottom of page 10, going over to the top of page 11. Um, and this, the, these breakdowns um, came through with recommendations uh, from the executive branch, but really through our joint appropriations and other staff um, working through these amounts. And I'll, uh, to Senator Costs, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, had some very good points. Um, and if, if you aren't aware, I've been working on several projects here in Natrona County through two of these different funds. Um, and, and that's uh, the HHS Health and um, uh, Capital Construction on one um, and uh, the other are el eligible water and sewer projects, which Casper, Evansville, Mills, um, and uh, the Salt Creek uh, water line. Um, I've been intimately involved Chairman, with okay, them. Sorry, go ahead. Mr. Sure. Chairman, I think we're getting a little off track. Here. Okay, sorry. You're up to the swing. Can you, can you uh, limit your testimony to the bill uh, in, in front of us, please? Well, so it is to the bill, but I'll, I'll make it short. The, um, the applications were due August 12th. And if you're not aware, that's what Director Scoggins was talking about. This ship has already sailed and now the legislature with this new bill wants to muck it up. Um, and in particular, those footnotes of 16, 17 and 18, which are on page 13 and 14 detailed, um, that's exactly what, what we're talking about. Um, and lastly, back on page 20, um, in, in that section, which starts, I guess, back on 18, the, 
the governor um, on page 20, line eight, notwithstanding any other provision of this act or other law, the governor may, but it's not required to, transfer positions, personnel, property, and appropriated funds from the office to state lands investments to the Wyoming Business Council as necessary to implement this act if the governor determines it is necessary to support the grant and loan functions of the Wyoming Business Council. So I asked the committee, this, this is not a good idea, in my opinion. The agencies can't say that, but I can. And I ask you to not move this forward. And if you do so, um, it, it, the ship has already sailed. And if you're mad about something, say it. Uh, but that's my recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you, Representative. Okay, it looks like we have one more public comment online and in the interest of time, I'm just gonna ask anybody providing testimony to not repeat previous testimony. Uh, it's certainly adequate to say I agree with uh, something that's already been said. So that being said, welcome. It looks like we have uh, Kathy Lenz online, if that's correct. Please introduce yourself to the committee and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Kathy Lenz and I've recently accepted a position as the resource and economic development uh, manager for Senator Lummis. However, I'm not here today on behalf of that position. I'm here wearing a former hat um, as a clerk treasurer and a member of the Wyoming Association of Municipal Clerks and Treasurer for the past 15 years. Um, I am a frequent flyer or was a frequent, frequent flyer of both of these um, grant and loan um, organizations. And I too am here to speak that concerns. And I just wanna say, I agree with the director, both of them on, the, on, the, on what a feat it would be to move them together. And my concerns today would be of course, the ARPA funding because of um, the timeline on that and the volume of dollars involved in getting that out. But also I have concerns about the staff. We have, we have amazing staff on both of these organizations and they, their, their programs do wonderful things for our communities in different ways. Um, as I said, economic development or loans in the water. And it would be a shame to um, lose any staff in the move or actually um, uh, convolute the programs that this wonderful state offers our community. And just wondering if the timing um, could not be moved to a different time. And, and I stand for questions and I appreciate uh, you accepting my comments. Okay, thank you very much for taking time. This one's good to hear from you. Okay, Thanks. any comment in the room? Okay, seeing none, no more online. Public comment is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Representative Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we all realize that this is an effort to help the uh, their state lands with the tremendous burden they have with all the things that are on their plate right now. But I don't feel like the timing is correct uh, for multiple of reasons that we've heard. So I make a motion that we table this bill. Okay. Yes, I believe that that's meant indefinitely. So table indefinitely, any discussion? Please. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion carries. Okay. The chairman doesn't vote unless it's a tiebreaker. So anyways, um, it would have made a big difference. So ladies and gentlemen, we this is our state lands, I guess, uh, end, end of the opportunity to get a bill draft going for dealing with state lands for our next meeting. Uh, we've heard two other suggestions from the stock growers, which we have not yet um, really take it, uh, gotten going. I think we'll have that discussion here in a little bit, uh, but any more public comment in general on state lands before we move on to our next topic. Okay, anything online? Okay, public comment is closed, committee. Uh, any additional bill draft requests that now is the time to do it for state lands. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to propose a bill draft to uh, put an advisory committee between the state lands and the slip board. 
Okay. Any okay. Any detail as to what that board would look like or any? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, six per six person board, three from agriculture, three from industry, three from general public. That's nine. Or it's two, two, two and two, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So provisional proposal to have an advisory board um at uh, all advises the director on state lands issues. I think the idea being to get some expertise from industry, from agriculture, and from the public at large. So that's the motion. Is there a second? Okay, that motion fails. Any additional motion? Yes. Go ahead. All right. There were, Mr. Chairman, there there were a couple other suggestions from uh, the stock growers. And I would would like to for us to consider a couple other draft proposals. Um, one would provide that grazing on non-owned livestock does not per se require prior approval by OSLI, and it would just clarify some things that uh, that have tended to be a real sore spot. Um, and I I think we could address it in statute and probably fix those things. So. I would first propose that one. Okay, uh, and that's the discussion we had uh, a little bit earlier this morning, if you recall. Um, is there a second? Okay, seconded by uh, Senator Cost or Representative Larson. A any discussion? Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. That motion carries. Mr. Co -chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman, and, and then the second one, um, I think we've dealt with the other ones. Yep, we have. The second one is to clarify that having actual and necessary use of the land and available forage is a fundamental requirement to qualify as a leasee. And uh, so that would be a clarification of, of Wyoming Statute 36.5.105, a clarification. And I would propose that we draft uh, bill for our next meeting uh, to deal with that part. Okay, so another uh, measure, fairly short bill draft to clarify the definition of actual and beneficial use. Is there a second? Second by Senator Cost. Any discussion? Representative Larson. Mr. Chairman, is there any way to uh, combine those two since they're the same statute? With the cooking combine what 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 exactly? Yeah, okay. The uh, two uh, motions that were made. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Yeah. I <clears throat> I think we could do that, but then we run the risk of passing one part of it and not passing the other part. Um, I'd rather both of them passed as well, but if we separate them and have two. Yeah, I don't know. Um, go ahead. And I think even though they're in the same section of statute, they're two completely different concepts. And so I, I think it might make more sense to keep them separate, but certainly that's at the will of the committee. And I think this does kind of touch on some of the testimony we heard this morning. There is maybe more, more nuanced discussions to have about, you know, is there a difference between somebody who has you know, is going to use a lease for rotational grazing versus somebody who's trailing something through that that area. Um, so we might have an opportunity to further define uh, if we want to prioritize one type of uh, um, actual necessary use over another. This would be an opportunity to provide that clarity. So, anyways, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Okay, any further discussion on state lands? for this meeting. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to our next agenda item. We'll just go ahead and press through. I, I guess we haven't really had a break, have we? But we're tough. Do you need a break? No, I, I was looking at you when I said I it, so. Okay, <laughs> you can, you're excused representative. If you... <laughs> okay, so um, next up we have an update on uh, uh, one of the more exciting things I think we did last session. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, so we'll be hearing from our um, 
Uh, we do have the governor's office um, on the agenda, but we I think we want to switch up the agenda with the wild horse management updates. We have uh, members of the tribes here to uh, provide an update, and I think that uh, you know they have a little less flexibility with their schedules. So, uh, do we have any representatives from um, either of the the tribes here to give us an update on the wild horse management issues? Okay, Mr. McNevin, are you representing anybody? Okay, well, we'll go to the uh, the governor's office and if, if they're online. I think Ms. Barlow's there. So go ahead, Ms. Barlow, welcome to the Ag Committee. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to update with the funds that you all approved on uh, this legislative session. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you said, this, um, and I believe you all have the opportunity to directly follow some of the work being done at the Honor Farm. So about all the great things they're doing with their program. Um, for approving these funds, um, it will allow the state of Wyoming efforts that are already ongoing. Are off the memo outlining the two projects that proposals to fund. Um, one is with the game, and one is with the Department of Corrections Honor Farm. Numbers in front of you, I will not recite them to you. Fix and the line items of what funds will be spent on what services and what different supplies. Um, for both who received the memo from us on August 15th, we have from both the, uh, to both the corrections, and so we're in the process of finalizing those with them. Project, we are hopeful to have that agreement done soon, on um, in the fall and the winter are ideal for gathers and the fools are weanable um, and make it a more some um, department of corrections we are also hopeful to have done in the variants will be on the ground and doing good work that this for the governor's office to do and with that i will stand Hey, thanks, Kate. We were having a little, little, little bit of trouble hearing. I think we have some technical issues, but I think we heard that we're close to an agreement. The uh, target date is fall and winter for these gathers. Is that correct? That I did get a message from a colleague that said it. Okay, so we'll appreciate your testimony. Uh, can we any questions for the governor's office on this update? Okay, we appreciate it and uh, stand by there. We'll, uh, we have uh, some testimony in the room and we'll see if we have any additional questions for you. Okay, so moving on, uh, do we have a representative of our uh, tribal governments here? Uh, uh, feel free to come on down and introduce yourself and uh, uh, provide us any information you think we should know. Good afternoon, thank you all. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Pastors, the co-chairman of the Northern Rapport Business Council. Chairman and committee members, thank you. Uh, appreciate the time. I um, wanted to come and um, get some public comment uh, as far as an, an updates as far as where we are with the uh, feral horse management um, roundup, we call it. Yeah. So um, our director of the fishing game, Art Lawson, is uh, leading the charge as far as um, preparing and working with the governor's office and, and the state as far as uh, devising the plan for this roundup. And again, we wanna just thank you all and appreciate you all very much for, for doing so and passing the legislation to help us with these efforts for, again, it's a longstanding issue that we all face just the same here on the reservation. And it's something that we've been working towards to try and tackle just ourselves through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and again, the tribes itself. So as far as where we are, 
is we are waiting on Eastern Shoshone to uh, finish uh, reviewing and signing off on their end. The Northern Rapo, we've already signed off and uh, I've been participating with the governor and, and staff to uh, work on devising and, and preparing and planning. And so the last update I received from the director, uh, Art Lawson of our fishing game, he's also working with uh, the US Fish and Wildlife and of course uh, the Wyoming uh, fishing game also. I believe they're gonna look to use some of the same contractors that BLM uses for the roundup uh, with the helicopters and everything, um, catch pens. And so we really appreciate it and look forward to um, using the avenue to uh, continue these things going forward. Because again, what little we've been able to do ourselves, you know, is, um, I think we're we're close to maybe around 1500 with our own device plan and, and the tribes putting in their own money. I think uh, year to date is about 1500 horses. And so with some of the funds that have been able to um, acquire through through all y'all's legislation, uh, we'll be able to do that in a, in a in a day or so with that same amount, you know, and so. We're really appreciative and uh, look forward to uh, making this a success. And just want to say thank you all as a committee and appreciate all that help. From the Northern Rapport Tribe, thank you. Hey, any questions? Mr. Winner, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could I ask you, uh, what are you folks doing with the horses that you're able to catch? With the horses that we do catch, um, we we sell them right here at the Riverton. Um, I can't even what is it? Livestock auction. Um, so you are not uh, under the same restrictions that the BLM has. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. Okay. Thank okay. you. Well, mm -hmm. think, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Representative Winner, uh, that is correct. The Wild Horse and Borough Act uh, only applies to uh, BLM lands. It does not apply to uh, tribal lands. Okay. And then, Mr. Winner, Mr. Chairman, uh, just one more thing I wanted to add. Um, I believe they were, uh, Art Lawson was looking for um, another contractor that they can look to um, send a much larger portion to. Um, I'm not certain on the details of that yet, but I believe they are looking at, at a few other avenues as, as this bigger project comes to fruit. Representative Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At what point do you believe that you'll be, you'll have enough horses going that you'll be at a sustainable level so you can do a thousand a year or whatever it's gonna to take to just maintain. You look at that to be like two years down the road, five years down the road. Where, where do you see yourself? Uh, Chairman, um, thank you for that question, Representative. Um, I believe um, that's that's what we're still working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for, is to look at what is a, a manageable and sustainable number. And again, um, we, we kind of have the system set up so that it's able to be self-sustaining and so that it keeps that effort and that management plan in place. But I think they're still devising on what what is the the appropriate number that that we should aim for, you know, so that we're doing these roundups uh, continuously through the years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when you sell on these horses, are you are you making enough to to maybe meet the state halfway on on a, on the future roundups? Is that doable? Uh, Chairman, yes, I believe so. Uh, I believe that's the goal is to uh, ensure that we can um, create the program that eventually um, carries itself. And, and and so that this one time uh, help will be able to um, help this program be able to do as it should on its own. Thank you. Thanks for partnering with the state of Wyoming. Yeah, Mr. Ringo, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Chairman, uh, <clears throat> Representative Fortner, just as a, a little bit of uh, additional information on that, uh, the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service had put the uh, 
the current population is as at a minimum of, of 5,000 horses just here uh, on, on the uh, Wind River Reservation. And so it, it is, there's a significant, uh, um, to, to your question of what is sustainable, it's, it's a much smaller number than that, you know, that, that we know, but to get to an exact like a um, appropriate management level is, is uh, the, the tribal fishing game are working with US Fish and Wildlife Service to establish, a, establish an exact number. On the, the funding question, uh, that as, as council, uh, as, as co-chairman uh, Fast Horse alluded to is, is certainly the goal. Um, the things that we are, of course, you know, wait on with those sort of things is uh, the, the market, of course, fluctuates uh, with horses and then the uh, roundup costs, um, you know, depending upon the contractor, price of fuel, um, these sorts of things that are going into, you know, what that uh, roundup cost is. And we try to hopefully with this, be able to do it on a little bit more of an economy of scale. Uh, but certainly the input costs of, of the roundups, uh, we are seeing um, increase along with, you know, every, everything else. But uh, so some of those numbers and, and how much uh, will be a, a large factor in, uh, you know, to a certain over that, that rollover effect that you were inquiring about. Any further questions? Okay, just want to make sure that we're on track, we're on schedule. And uh, so just if you have an idea, when, when will this agreement have to be finalized in order to be effective and have ground up take place before our next legislative session in January? Uh, can you repeat that? Uh, just wondering what, you know, I'm just wondering what, at what point do you see this actually occurring? Is it, it's, I just want to verify it's in the fall or winter. Is that correct? I just want to make, I guess my point is that, you know, if we're going to have any additional funds, we have to go back with a successful program in mm -hmm. January and, you know, kind of the earlier, the better, you know? Right. Um, and so just wondering, uh, we have a little bit of discussion about what you see the timeline being and making sure that we're on track there. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, we're we're hoping so that in January we can provide a better update and actually have some real numbers for you guys to see. Uh, again, like I said, uh, the only thing that's holding us up right now is waiting on Eastern Shoshone, um, because again, we we've, we've currently been working up um, as as the two tribes um, at at this process, and so uh, again with these additional fundings, it's it's really just helped us to um, get ahead of that and um again prepare for a much larger project so we are hoping for this fall to really begin and like i said in january's legislative session we should be able to have something to show you guys looking forward to it perfect thank you any further <clears throat> questions can we um, oh, oh sorry you have something there yeah, yes mr Ch chairman i know it was difficult to to hear uh uh, Ms. Barlow uh, from the governor's office, but uh, the, the goal is, you know, this fall uh, to do something where you certainly hope that we do not have an extremely, you know, early winter, you know, that would, uh, you know, potentially throw a wrench uh, in that, but uh, getting the agreements finalized and then getting the contracts with the, with the, uh, the gather and then whether just those things are to be determined, but uh, the goal is, is certainly calendar year you know, 2021 or 2022 now. Okay, very good. All year behind. Okay, for other questions, please. Representative Winter, do you have something? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, would the, uh, in your estimation, would the tribes be open to uh, coming up with a slaughterhouse for horses on the reservation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chairman, thank you. Um, Representative Winters, um, that's something that has never been uh, presented or, or thought of before, but um, something worth uh, looking into. You know, again, um, as, a, as a two tribes, we're always looking at avenues for uh, economic development. Uh, again, we're, we're, we're trying to get on board with uh, uh, our own uh, meat packing. You know, we'd love to do that too. So, falls right in line so potentially you know but again it's it's just um ideas of course um but thank you for the thought yes thank you mr chairman um the, i've spoken with your the manager of the Rappo ranch mm -hmm. quite a bit and and he's all in favor of it as well 
and he thinks it would work good over there on that side of the hill. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we can get something going here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any further questions, committee? All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. And looking forward to hearing about a successful program here in the future. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything before we adjourn for the day? Okay, go ahead, Ms. Jarvis. Mr. Chairman, there was talk at the last meeting about getting all of the various organizations, the Bureau of Land Manage, all the folks who presented at the last meeting, as well as at this meeting, um, the Northern Arapaho Tribe, the Eastern Shoshone Tribe, the Wyoming Game and Fish, the Tribal Fish and Game, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all the folks who are already working together and to get them to come together and send, send a some sort of correspondence to the Wyoming delegation, as well as the, the Wyoming congressional delegation, as well as I believe the federal level of the BLM and, and the different land management organizations. And I just wanted to report that that endeavor is moving forward as far as some sort of draft that is um, thanks to the efforts of Representative Winter, he has been in contact with uh, various folks and there is a, is a draft that he has, has he and um, some folks from Wyoming, from our, our game and fish. And then I, it's also in my possession now to be able to try to be pulling something together in the way of correspondence. It's not, it's not ready yet, but it is in the works. And so that was something from June that I wanted to report back on. Oh, good job, Representative Winter. Appreciate it. Appreciate the staff's work as always. So uh, Representative Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so the committee knows that there is legislation being proposed out of Minnesota or Michigan that will allow combat veterans to hunt wild horses on BLM property uh, supposed to help their PTSD and uh, and they'll they won't actually kill the horses they use a birth control dart just to let you know well I think that that highlights you know that we've heard some testimony from other groups that do this sort of birth control thing and there's probably lots of other opportunities that you know and, and so we have a successful gather here in the fall here on the reservation and have more groups kind of becoming known to us. Maybe it's someone we could reach out to. I think there's going to be lots of interesting possibilities to continue to build upon the success of recent years. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, so we'll go ahead and officially end the meeting. And if everyone wants to stick around, once we uh, get offline, we'll have some information about the tour. <laughs>